I'm going to hand the meeting over to our finance chair, Michael Moore. Michael? Uh, thank you, Joe. Um, I'd first like to uh, apologize. Uh, the first bo uh, workshop we had uh, lasted till 1030 and it was snowing. So um, even though it's very important topics tonight, we'll end, uh, we'll go till 930. And that way, I, some of you may have babysitters and we all have families to get back to. So hopefully we'll get through as much as we can. Uh, what we don't, we'll move to uh, another uh, budget workshop. Uh, so uh, welcome to the fourth budget workshop for the 2015-2016 school budget. I will quickly review the agenda and format for the workshop. Tonight we will review instructional support, uh, preschool, staffing, salaries and benefits, and office of the superintendent. Uh, tonight's agenda or format will be as follows. First, we will welcome public comments on the agenda items I just discussed, instructional support, preschool, uh, staffing, salary and benefits, office of the superintendent. Uh, I will ask you to limit your comments to three minutes. Uh, this will ensure everyone has an opportunity to speak. We will allocate 30 minutes to public comments. If there is need for more time, uh, the board can extend this. Uh, before we set, open up to public comment, I would like to again share a section of Cape School's mission and vision statement. Um, it states, uh, the, ethics, the ethics portion of the Cape School's mission and vision statement says, we value decision making and actions guided by principles of personal integrity, empathy, responsibility, and respect for self and others. These are the ethics we hope our students will develop and nurture. Keeping these ethics in mind as we proceed tonight, should we be hard on the issues? Absolutely. Should we be open to different views and perspectives? Yes. Should all of us here tonight proceed with a commitment to respectful and thoughtful dialogue? I believe we should and hope we do. Uh, with that, I would like to open up the meeting to public comments. Uh, again, please try to limit your comments to approximately three minutes. This will ensure everyone has an opportunity to speak. And for those new to the public comment format, if your comments include specific questions, hopefully they will be addressed later tonight in the workshop as we review the topics on the agenda. If you feel your questions were not addressed in the workshop or you need more information on an issue, please contact the school board uh, and email is a great way to do that. Uh, so with that, uh, let's get started. And if you'd be so kind to uh, provide your name. Um, so. Thank Hello. You. Hello, I'm Ann Gray. Please keep the full-time position of Director of Instructional Support and approve funds for full-time district-wide behaviorists. With the proposed budget discussing changes in staffing, several parents and I thought the school community and taxpayers needed a voice in the decision-making process. We posted a petition asking community members for feedback. I will share the results with you. 140 parents former educators and concerned community members agreed that the changes were not beneficial to students and that we need a full-time director of instructional support and a full-time behaviorist. They signed and wrote strong, supportive responses. Full results of the petition with up-to-date signatures and a link can be found on the hard copy provided. For our purposes, I'll share three responses with you. Number one, all children are only available to learn if their emotional needs are met. This goes beyond the expertise of a classroom teacher. Number two, I am in support of a full-time instructional support director and behaviorist. These budget cuts affect every child in the classroom and this support is necessary for our wonderful Cape Elizabeth teachers to best educate our children. Number three, these positions are critical to the integrity of the special education instructional support program. Five years ago, CAPE was considered to have one of the finest instructional support programs in the state. Under the current school leadership, the program has decimated. It is very disappointing and also reprehensible. My husband, Sean, and I have three children attending Pond Cove School. One of our children has an IEP and receives instructional support services. Our other two children are in classrooms having many students with IEPs. I volunteer in our classrooms and am familiar with the culture of the classrooms and with the educational expectations of our amazing teachers and students. We share common concerns around the education of our children, and it's with that perspective that I address you tonight. Our teachers are adept at providing differentiated curriculum for our children. 
They're informed on current and best practice and effective ways to instruct. They have relevant approaches to their teaching and varied techniques for addressing the most adverse learning behaviors and assisting students with learning challenges. However, they need more support. Teachers need a strong role and a voice in the decision-making process. Let's move beyond rhetoric and self-interest and support our children and our teachers. In Cape Elizabeth, we need a full-time director of instructional support and a full-time district-wide behaviorist, not only to meet but to exceed the expectations of success for all of our students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cindy Volts. I'm Elliot's mom and James' mom. And both of my boys receive support in our schools. And, and I would actually consider them instructional support success stories. Elliot has autism spectrum disorder. He's in the eighth grade at CMS. He has an IEP and receives special education support and services, which enable him to participate in the mainstream classroom. He's also the star of this, every time this gets me. Mm -hmm. He's also the star of the CEMS math team, regularly placing in the top three in his grade in the Southern Maine Math League competition. We're, cur we're currently planning his transition to high school. Or his program will include honors and in AP courses. Thank you. Elliot's success would not be possible if it weren't for the support of the extraordinary and dedicated educators and instructional support staff in our schools. James is in the third grade at Pond Cove. He doesn't receive special education services, but he experienced some significant challenges in his first year. With the help and intervention of the on-site behavior support specialist and social worker at Pond Cove, he was able to show great improvement within a few months. Without that support, James' issues were overwhelming for the classroom teacher and very disruptive to other students. I'm very proud of both boys. <coughs> Sadly, I don't believe the children in school in Cape Elizabeth today have the same support and opportunities. Budget cuts and organizational changes have eliminated critical programs for children with special needs. My family's feeling it too. In the past two years, we have experienced the loss of the life skills program at the middle school, the elimination of the choices room and behavior specialist at Pond Cove, and increasing staff turnover in both schools. We've also noticed a decline in staff availability and openness of communication an increasing number of staff reassignments and resignations. And I've also noticed a pattern of an overall weakening of Elliot's IEP, and it seems the focus is shifting to more on procedure and, and less on the success and raising the bar and the goals for my child. Once, what was once a collaborative process now feels adversarial, as we've had to firmly and persistently advocate just to, re just to retain an appropriate level in support and services. Maintaining instructional support staffing is an important step in the right direction, but there's still a lot of work to be done to return our instructional support program to the same standard of excellence we provide in all other areas in our school system. I'm asking you, the board and the superintendent, to provide the leadership to restore the first-rate education we provide to all students, including those who are differently abled. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> My name is Audra Welton. I attended my very first budget meeting this month, and it was really very interesting for me. When I left, the thing that has been on my mind over these few weeks actually is the teacher-student ratios. And, the, and I, I spent a lot of time looking over all of the different documents, which I'm so thankful are, are online and available for parents and community members to look at. And I was really impressed with the way the policy is written regarding class size by the school board. And, but, but that's what I want to come back to is, are those numbers. And being at that exact top of 22 students, that is a very full classroom. And the idea of adding a .1 child to that or a .7 or a whole child above and beyond, that is an overflowing classroom. And I was thinking, how many educations does that affect? It's not just this sort of one <coughs> extra child, it's the entire classroom and the entire structure. And so I, I was hoping another parent might, might sort of pick this up and talk about it. And I, I just thought, are, 
Is it that parents don't know that this is being proposed this year for this larger classroom size and this is the trend that we seem to be heading in? Or are we okay with it? So I decided to start sending some emails. And what has happened is la at last look, there are over 90, 98 parents went on and signed a petition and many of them wrote comments not realizing and individual emails to me saying they did not know that this is what's been happening and being proposed for this year. So I will, um, I gave a hard copy of, at, when I printed it was at 88, um, but I will send the fuller list of our parents who are writing and asking you to please, this, I kept it simple for them. I mean, all that, okay, all that extra, that's all my comments. Now, this is what all the parents said. This is it. Please do not exceed the recommended class size in our Cape Elizabeth School District for the 2015-2016 school year. Please do not put our children's education at risk. So that's what I'm asking, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jeff Vickery, and um, I have a son in instructional support. And I, I believe, you know, there's a, there was a survey that had gone around and I had um, read it. And it's basically done by um, the staff. So um, I'm just going to read from this since it's a little easier. Um, have we taken into consideration the views of the educators in regards to the budget, both mainstream and special needs, to verify that the staff workloads and concerns are being met? One of the reasons I'm asking this um, is I'm hoping that I'm going to hear the answer to it tonight in the meeting because of a recent survey I read. In regards to this survey, there are over a dozen references uh, direct to the staff um, to the educators or the staff regarding the district leadership. Um, one of the questions, or one of the sections specifically, was on how well are educators empowering our, um, empowered in our district. And it was broken out into multiple um, questions within that, and it had um, either an agreement or a disagreement rate of um, how they felt. And overall, it was. 11% in agreement and 63% in disagreement. So that kind of made me feel that, geez, is everyone comfortable in being able to bring issues to bear? So anyway, so what I did is I just kind of looked at three of them that I wanted to mention. Uh, district leadership makes sustained effort to address faculty and staff concerns about climate and leadership issues. For that one, 8% 80, uh, 8 agreed, 70% disagreed. Another question was difficulty. Uh, <laughs> faculty and staff feel comfortable raising issues and concerns that are important to them in conversations with the district leadership. 13% agreed, 75% disagreed. Third question I concentrated on was, um, is there an atmosphere of trust and mutual respect in our district? 4% agreed, 80% disagreed. Naturally, that just kind of makes you wonder. Um, so I have to, again, say, are the staff's workloads and concerns being met? And are we communicating and being able to get feedback from them? You know, for me, that's a big thing, trust is being able to have an open forum for everyone to communicate, no matter what level they're at. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, my name is Cree Swift. I have two children in the schools. Uh, sorry, my youngest. Uh, is in second grade. He has Down syndrome and he receives special education services. I believe a full-time instructional support director is critically important. In the CAPE system, there is a need for real leadership, strategy, and planning in the special ed program, and I don't think that this can be done on a part-time basis. 
In my own personal experience, we've already had several teachers who have never before taught a student with Down syndrome. Some of them have never taught a student with special needs. It's surprising given the number of students, but that's what they tell me. Um, these teachers need resources and support in order to engage and include my child in the regular education programming. They can't do it alone. The special education teacher in Pond Cove has worked incredibly hard to keep on top of our son's schedule, his therapies, and his curriculum. But this is an enormous task, and of course, he's also working to teach my son and other children too. The regular ed teacher is balancing a standard curriculum against the strengths and needs of individual children in the classroom, some of whom are on IEPs. And what I believe is missing, and has been missing since we've been here, is real structure and communication between the regular ed and the special ed teachers, as well as with therapists, that is designed to facilitate inclusive learning. So for example, if the second grade classroom is learning about butterflies, my son needs to be prepared to do this, and he's not right now. He can't just jump in like other kids can in the regular ed programming. The second grade teacher needs to know what are the skills and strengths that my son has that he can bring to the table to learn about butterflies. What parts of the curriculum can be adapted to allow him to access the learning, whether it's storyboards and pictures, physical activity, whatever, whatever uh, makes this happen. I thought that the move away from ed tech resources and two special ed teachers a few years ago would do this, but in my experience, it hasn't. One year at Open House, a regular ed teacher, his teacher told me, I don't really know how your son is doing. Dave Croft would know. And that's wrong, it's unacceptable. And that kind of thing happens in a school district without leadership on effective inclusion. According to his IEP that year, my son was in her classroom more than 50% of the time, but she didn't know how he was doing. My sense is that programming is moving towards inclusion for the sake of inclusion and without the supports that our kids need to succeed. Behavioral concerns are only going to increase as frustrated students are given less and less support in the classroom. I have found the district's response on this issue particularly disingenuous. There are two behaviorists in the district. That's the party line right now. But how many hours a week do each of them work with our children? And more importantly, with the teachers, with the ed techs, and with the therapists. You, the board, need to be focused on that number, the number and the quality of those hours. And then take a look at how many days a year kids in the classroom require adult support. There's intervention needed because of issues in the classroom. Uh, two just quick last thoughts. Uh, one on Special Olympics. Some of our children aren't able to participate in the community or uh, uh, school sports programs. Someday I hope that they can, and I hope that we can have a unified team here in Cape. Uh, but what I've seen in Special Olympics here has been incredibly good for our children. Um, and sometimes that means time taken away from the regular ed classroom. That's a debate and a discussion that's been under, it's been contentious here. Um, my view, I think it's worth it. I think it's a very important program for our kids. I also want to note that since I've been here uh, 11 years now, uh, for six of those years, I've been on the board of directors <coughs> of the Disability Rights Center here in Maine. That's a legal advo advocacy organization uh, supporting the rights of persons with disabilities. These are people in the state who know the school systems. And when I got on the board, they said, oh, you live in Cape. It's the greatest school district. We never get calls from Cape parents. Um, that's changed, and, uh, and the view of Cape as a leader in special education, I think, has changed, and uh, we can do better, and we need your help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Wayne Brooking, Two Lakes Road. I'm a graduate of Cape Elizabeth High School, as were both of my parents, my paternal grandmother and paternal great-grandmother and many other family members. I'm extremely proud of that fact. In 2008, I had the opportunity to return to Cape Elizabeth and was excited to be back home. I was also excited that I would soon be enrolling my children in what has historically been an excellent school system. At that time, two of my three small children were newly diagnosed on the autism spectrum. So my wife and I were nervous about the special education program, what it would look like here in Cape Elizabeth. While conducting research into schools, 
We often met with medical professionals, support providers, and other parents of children receiving special instructional support, not only in this town, but in other towns as well. And they gave us nothing but overwhelming praise for the programs, educators, and service providers here in Cape. After our initial transitional IEP, with our oldest child's entry into kindergarten in 2009, we felt we had indeed made a good decision and we're in a school system built to meet the appropriate educational needs of all children. The communication between us and the educators and even the administration was wonderful. And we built up a healthy level of trust in them and the programs they were offering our children. After a couple of years, we began to notice that changes were being made in various programs. We noticed cuts in needed ed tech positions. Educators were placed in different positions around the district without any explanation to parents or to our children who need structure and consistency in their lives. Staff who were well loved by our children and highly respected by their peers were resigning and their positions were left vacant. The once wonderful level of communication seemed to evaporate. Now there has developed what appears to be a veil of secrecy to services that our children are receiving. Service providers have become reluctant to tell us when services are being offered to our children. The life skills program in the middle school mysteriously dissolved and this has greatly impacted my daughter's education and goals towards independence. The amazing swim program that our children love that was run by dedicated volunteers preparing them for the Special Olympics meets and was a neutral budgetary program was ended without any notification, notification to parents or discussion with the IEP teams. The loss of a special educator who also served as a behaviorist has been one of the most devastating losses yet. Now we feel that our children's needs are not being met with the current programming and we find that we have little trust in the administration or their program. Any further cuts to the instructional support department and letting the open ed tech and special educator positions remain vacant will only cause the program to deteriorate to a devastating level. Today, as we interact with outside service providers, medical professionals, and other parents who have children with special needs, we mention that our kids go to Cape Elizabeth, we get frowns, head shakes, and looks of concern. Is this really the reputation that we want to have for our schools? I know I don't. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Zach Greenfield. Uh, thank you to the school board for being here. I know we have a difficult job, and uh, you have to come away from your families to deal with things like this, and there's a lot of pressure on you to do uh, the right thing. I think doing the right thing when it comes to instructional support is an easy thing. Don't cut the budget. It's not the kind of town we want to live in. Uh, many of us moved to Cape Elizabeth because we thought Cape Elizabeth was the type of town full of generous people who look after each other, look after each other's children. When I hear that the budget for instructional support is going to be cut, it makes me wonder if that's really the town that we all want. And we don't. We want a town of generosity that takes care of the children who need the help. And this isn't just for the children who have special needs. It's for all the other children in the classroom. It's for all the parents. It's for everybody in this town because the reputation of our town depends upon what you do with these difficult questions. So I encourage you, do not cut the special education budget in any way. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Bill Gross. I'm uh, here to talk about item two on the agenda, the preschool item. Uh, I saw this just yesterday on the uh, meeting agenda. I wasn't sure what it was. I sent an email to Mr. Moore, and thank you very much for your very fast turnaround time getting an answer back to me. Apparently, uh, the school board is considering spending $50,000 to start a sort of, a, I guess, a pilot program for preschool for a certain number of children. And I'm here tonight because I don't think it would be a good idea to do this. I would urge the school board not to start any such program. <clears throat> Everything I know uh, about this, the studies I've looked at, says that, that preschool programs show a, a increase in performance by children while they're taking the preschool course. But then, after a year or two, all of that increase in academic performance is dissipated. So I think the, the, the program would be very ineffective. 
And the second thing I'm worried about is once we start something like this, if we start it for a few students, uh, then it will there'll be a, a lot of pressure to extend it to to all of for every uh, preschool for every incoming uh, kindergarten student the year before they come to kindergarten. And then if ever the school board decides, well, this really isn't effective, which based on all these studies, it's certainly going to the, the school board will certainly see then imagine how hard it's going to be to withdraw something. Just look at the, all the parents here tonight on instructional support. If you, once you provide a service to children in the school system, trying to withdraw that service is going to create an enormous reaction from the pool. parents. Understandably, if, if my child was receiving a service and the school was going to take it away, I'd be very much against it. So let me talk a little bit about these studies that, that, uh, on, on, and how effective preschool is. Uh, I've got a... Uh, Went online and found a, uh, a, uh, a study by a professor, uh, Stream, uh, uh, Stringham, down in uh, Fayetteville State University. And he referred uh, to a, uh, a researchers at Vanderbilt University who, uh, who did an a in-depth study of children who attended Tennessee's government-administrated preschools and found that by first grade, any be benefits provided by the preschools had vanished entirely. So what this means is you're... The student, you, you take uh, 100 students, 50 of them go to preschool, 50 of them do not. They, then you compare their performance while they're in preschool. And of course, the academic performance of the 50 children who are in preschool is higher than the academic performance of the 50 children who are not going to school at all. But once the, 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 all, of the, all 100 children are in uh, kindergarten and first grade, all of those uh, increased performance differences vanish completely. Now, the, the, probably one of the most famous studies is, is the Perry Preschool Study. It's, it was uh, done back, started back in, 19, in the 60s, and the unique thing about this is they continued watching the students for 40 years. And online on uh, highscope.org, a, a, uh, uh, there was a uh, question saying, although they're looking, now they're looking at, at the kids who took preschool in the 1960s, and now it's, they're looking in... Uh, in the year in, in the early 2000s on what their what happened with them and the question was although the program has a strong effect on children's intellectual performance didn't it fade out over time it is true that the high scope Perry preschool program has a statistically significant effect on children's IQs during and up to a year after the program but not after that this pattern has been found in numerous other studies such as those in the Consortium of Longitudinal Studies in 1983. Now, this Perry study is very is probably the most famous study. Now, the Perry study did find a long-term difference. The study shows that high-quality preschool education has no effect on children's scholastic performance after a year or so. But it does seem to have a long-term social benefits, such as higher high school graduation rates, fewer students arrested as an adult. Now this is, is this would, th this uh, study would have no help to uh, Cape Elizabeth. Cape Elizabeth just at the last school board meeting we were told that our uh, our high school graduation completion rate is 99 percentile, and certainly there's no problem with uh, high school uh, with with uh, Cape Elizabeth students who after they're adults having a high rate of incarceration. So and the last thing I want to refer to is the 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 2000 and the 2010 study by the, on, on, uh, by the Department of Health and Human Services on the Head Start program. It was called the Head Start Input Impact Study, the final report. And I'm quoting from it. While the children benefited from being in Head Start while they were in the program, there was virtually no impact once they left the program. So again, uh, it sounds as like from, from what Mr. Moore shared with me that the school board is going to consider spending some dollars for a pilot program for preschool. And then my fear is this will expand. It will become not $50,000, but now it will be $100,000, $200,000. And it will be money ill spent. And it will be very, very, just judging by the reaction on the instructional support uh, uh, topic on the agenda, it will be very, very hard down the road to withdraw that preschool spending, even if. Uh, we find out in Cape Elizabeth what everyone else has found out who studied this problem. Preschool only has an effect on, on improving the scholastic performance of children while they're in preschool.
A year or two after they're out of preschool, there is absolutely no difference on the academic performance of children who went to preschool and children who did not go to preschool. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Hi, my name is John Voltz. I'm a parent of two kids here in Cape Elizabeth, James and Elliot, which has been introduced previously. I'll keep my comments brief. First of all, I applaud you for uh, looking at adding a preschool. I think the, the economic benefits of that are clear, and that the dollars are something like four or five to one in terms of the economic benefit to the entire society for that. Um, so I sent some extensive comments uh, to the superintendent and the board about the materials that are that were with the special education budget. I wanted to just briefly elaborate on, on those publicly so people understand what I thought was missing from the previous discussion, which includes references to historical data of how the population is changing and how the needs are changing, not just the point data. Um, this is really important when you're looking at something because right now, if you only have, you know, it's better than no aim steering, but if you only have one point of data, you get to steer like this. You don't know where you're going. And so the historical data is really important to understand how things are changing, not just now, but how they have changed and how they might change. Um, and the, the other one has to do with staff utilization and looking at that at a granular level. I think that data is available, and we track it very carefully, and it's an important part of how the, we have, we, uh, maintain excellent education in our high schools, our middle schools, and our class sizes, and we look at that very carefully. And although special education is complex, I think it, it, it means that you have to look at that data and monitoring that much more so. And then the last thing I would add is that um, what we really need is performance measures of how are we doing, because that's what really matters in the end. It's not how we get it done, it's what actually, how are we actually improving the outcomes that we're trying to improve. And you know we're not alone in this. We have no data on that that's reported along with the budget. But not as far as I know, we're not really tracking anything that consistently that's reported publicly about how we are performing. Uh, and that's really what I would urge. I don't know what the right sets of performance measures are. I think there's a lot of them. Um, this is nationwide. You're moving from much more of a compliance point of view to a performance point of view, which makes a lot of sense. Standards are important, but they're standards so that you can meet performance because that's what counts. We have a chance to be out in the forefront of this. I would urge that we would move in that direction and we set performance standards that we regularly publish and monitor. And the last thing I would say is uh, a recommendation to the board. As you've said, as you've noted, special education is complex. It actually receives money from a number of different pots and it's all actually not all in one budget and it has a number of different aspects to it. And I would urge that the school board consider forming a subcommittee that addresses specifically special education so that it is, you are well prepared to understand exactly what we, what we are trying to do and how we are trying to do it in this area which represents a significant part of the overall school budget and is, and is important to all the kids in all our schools. Um, and with that, I'll close. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you very you. much. Hi, my name is Randy Ballenbach. I live at 51 Belfield Road, and I'd like to talk about um, the agenda item about uh, pre-K education. And I realize we don't have all the details. It's just an item on the agenda, and I saw it on the website, so I can only address what I know, which is relatively scant, but I, I, have, a, I have a global perspective on this I'd like to state. Um, I've lived here for 10 years. I have always voted for whatever tax increase was on the agenda. I've always supported the schools, and most of the tax increase obviously is, is taken into the schools, since that's the majority of the budget. So by voting for that new tax measure, I am in effect voting for supporting the schools. I believe it is the probably number one thing behind property values. I take it seriously. So for 10 years, I've always voted for the budget. I don't have a child in the school anymore. I continue to vote for whatever the budget in requested increase is. Uh, I do that knowing that typically it outstrips the pace of inflation. I accept that because I think that anything to do with unions and labor costs typically do outstrip inflation. I, I, I view that as rational and predictable and acceptable. Um, so I have again voted, always voted despite that fact. Um, I, however, would not be able to vote for a budget that included pre-K. I think that is truly a need 
it's a, it's a want, not a need. I don't think it's critically necessary. And I don't know what will happen with the, um, with what this uh, committee plans to do and if this is a definitive recommendation, but I would not be in support of this. And I also feel that if it does become something that's part of the budget and ultimately uh, the budget will go to a vote for uh, citizens, I think it should be made clear that part of what's in that budget is money to go into pre-K as opposed to just bundling that information. I don't know that people are aware of the fact that we're adding something that while it may be small and experimental and more micro in its initial implementation, I think that once we start, like all things, it will become the universal item that is, and it will grow in cost as well. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Sarah Crawford. I have two daughters, one in sixth grade in the middle school and one in fourth grade. And um, I want to thank Audra for starting a petition, which she did less than 24 hours ago. Um, the current number on her petition is at 103. Um, I signed both petitions, both for the special ed and for the class size, because I think both have a dynamic, both of these dynamics have a dramatic effect on the classroom. And I've volunteered since we moved here. And being in the classroom, you can see what the teachers are up against. Um, specifically, Stella's class is very boy heavy. And so just that dynamic has made it challenging for specific teachers over the, over the course of time. Um, we are increasing, I think, our expectations of our teachers. And the, the dynamic of pulling potentially special ed and techs out of the <coughs> classroom and increasing the class size to me sounds quite like a hurricane stirring. Um, Audra had said that you know this was new to her. She had not heard about the class size issue before. But I was here last year discussing the class size issue. And I know from last year's board meeting, I think it was probably just about this time, that there was a line of people also worried and concerned about the class size issue. Um, I think we can you know debate and try to predict what's going to happen with our populations. But having looked at a lot of the statistics, it seems like we're kind of verging on the top end. Um, and I ha I'm, he I'm here to express my concern, specifically for the fourth grade going into fifth grade class, which was last year, the third grade going into fourth grade class, and the idea of losing a teacher and combining teams. Um, having j lived through Sylvia jumping from fourth grade up to fifth grade, it's my opinion that fifth grade shouldn't be in middle school. The kids are too young to be considered part of that middle school. <coughs> so now I'm thinking of Stella jumping into middle school, which is a big change, combined with less ed techs, combined with bigger classes, and teams that are now not equally divided. It, it's gonna be a challenge, and I think you guys have the delightful ability to create environments that are stimulating and rewarding to both the teachers and the students. And I ask that you seriously think about what kind of environments you want those to be for the best learning that our kids can get. Uh, we moved here four years ago, five years ago, and we moved to Cape specifically because of this environment. And so I ask that you think about that in your decision making this evening. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Michael. Uh, nice to see you. Good to see uh, you again. Tim, Tim Thompson, Six Pine Ridge Road. Uh, I'm, I'm <clears throat> the beneficiary of this school system. All my kids got to go through here. And it's, a, it's a great school system. I thank you, school board members. Uh, it's just a gym. The school is, is just a gym, and the kids we, the education, the kids these, they, they get from this school system is, is amazing. Our teachers are amazing. Our administrators are amazing. Um, Jeff is, you know, you know, dearly loved by 
couple decades of kids now, and Kelly at the other end. Uh, what, what I, I guess what I'm here tonight is I've been involved with special needs kids for many years, uh, going back as far as uh, Oregon Special Olympics, uh, and more recently with the Morrison Center. And, uh, and, and what, what I'm hearing tonight is uh, a lot of concern about cutbacks on IEPs and, and services. And at the same time, uh, difficult choices to cut back. So I know there, there's never enough money. I mean, I've been coming to these things for, for decades, and there's never enough money. Uh, even in a town that's been quite generous with what they provide, there, there's just never enough money. You guys always have to make tough decisions. But, but tonight what I'd really like you to think about is this preschool. Um, uh, there's preschool. I, I think Bill make, made a lot of great points tonight. Um, I always walk away from my conversations with Bill knowing how to build a watch when I just ask him what time it is. But, <laughs> but, but Bill's good about doing that to me. But, but, uh, but I think, I think that the thing that I really want to just point out is, is uh, there are a lot of great preschools all around our town. There are a lot of great preschools right on the, the borders in South Portland. There is a great preschool at the Morrison Center in Scarborough that's got, pre, uh, that's got uh, preschool for, for kids with typically developing children and kids with special needs. They can, get, they can get speech therapy there, occupational therapy, they can get physical therapy there. There's opportunities for that out there. So what I'd really like you to think about before we go into this kind of experiment to see about what we could do in the preschool arena, take stock of what's already out there. And, 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 and try to think about the, the cuts that we're making in some of these other areas for some of these parents uh, that have to battle every day with their IEPs. And it's, it's not our fault. I mean, it's what it is. But it is a battle for them. And however we can support them, uh, I'd like to see us do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't see anyone um, interested in speaking. So uh, thank all of you for um, taking the time of your uh, taking the time out of your day to come and, and provide some input. Um, I would like before we go into our first topic agenda, just to um, help people. Uh, one of our goals is help people understand how the budget process works. And I mentioned this at the last meeting. Um, the school board reviews each agenda item. Uh, ask questions, often ask for additional information. Um, much of that information we ask for we publish and post on the website. Um, and we try to understand in each workshop the needs of a particular department or a different area. What we don't do after reviewing you know, instructional support tonight or last, our first workshop when we review class sizes, the board doesn't make a vote on a particular area. And the reason we don't do that, it would be difficult for me to look a citizen in the face and say, why well, supported something to add or subtract a teacher in class sizes? Well, Michael, how would you know that without looking at the whole budget? Why wouldn't you want to hear and take public comments in all the areas? So what we do is we review all the different areas, ask questions, and then the night once we're done reviewing all the areas, yes, school board members will make recommendations on increasing staff, decreasing staff, and at that time, we may vote on a particular area. But we only do that after reviewing the entire budget. So if your question tonight is, are they going to increase teacher in a certain grade, or you won't get that answer. And the reason you won't is we need to review the entire budget before I can look someone in the eye and say, I understand the entire budget, I understand all 1,600 student needs before I can make a decision. Um, and just so people know, we did review class sizes at uh, the second workshop, and so um, I don't want anyone who came and spoke on that to feel that we're dismissive of, dismissive of that. We did discuss it. We reviewed the class sizes in every grade. We looked at the class sizes. We looked at the recommended changes. We asked each building principal uh, if they were going to have a grade that was above the class size, how they felt about that. Again, we haven't made a decision, but I don't want anyone to feel that we didn't ask the questions. And just to summarize class sizes, 
um, in Pond Cove in the middle school, there will be 52 classes uh, proposed for 2015-16. That's 52 classes. 32 of the classes will be below the recommended sizes. That's 62 percent of the classes will be below the recommended size. 16 uh, classes will be uh, at the recommended size and four classes would be uh, above the recommended size. So out of 52 classes, there would be four classes that would be above the recommended size, and each of those classes would have one additional student. So in terms of the trend, um, another way said, 92% uh, of the classes would be at or below the recommended size, and that compares to this year of 74%. Um, so basically, just to give you an idea, so what school board members will have to say is, are you comfortable with four classes above the recommended size? Conversely, we'll have to get comfortable, are we comfortable that we have 32 classes that are below the recommended size? So um, in other words, we'll have to get comfortable with those. And like I said, we won't make that decision tonight, but just to provide you a way how, yes, we have four classes that would be one student above the recommended size, but we have 32 classes that we be below the recommended size. And in face of declining enrollment, we'll need to justify, well, why do you have that many classes below the recommended size? So thank you for letting me share that, just to give you an idea of how the budget process works and the different factors we'll have to weigh when we make those decisions. So moving rapidly along, um, instructional support. Um, uh, we did start or uh, had a lengthy discussion on instructional support at the the second budget workshop. Uh, we requested additional information. Much of that information has been posted to the website. Um, so I will turn it over to Jane and or Meredith and how they feel would be the, the most efficient way to proceed. So you're being provided at this point um, with the historical data from 2010-11 through the projected 2015-16 um, staffing numbers. Um, and there are extras, I believe, for the public. They're coming. Yep. Some of them are coming. Consistently, there has been one full-time administrator. And you will see the second line of that document shows you the um, numbers of teachers. And then instructional strategists are broken out from that. Those folks are still special educators and ultimately counted as part of our staff. Historically, in 2011, there were 13 instruct uh, three instructional strategists. Um, and that was the same for 2011-12. And then it reduced to two, and now there is one. Um, K-8, and we know from prior discussion that there is a department head model at the high school, so there is a department head of the special education group at Cape Elizabeth High School. Um, educational technicians are broken out there by ed tech ones, twos, and threes. Speech and language therapists are reflected here, occupational therapists um, at one point in this district of certified OT assistant was employed through 2012. That changed when two full-time <coughs> occupational licensed occupational therapists were hired. Physical therapy services have been consistent. Social workers has um, increased. And school psychologists have been consistent, as you see. And there are two additional days in the past three years that have been added for our school psychologists that are funded from federal dollars, not Cape Elizabeth School District funds. <laughs> Giving you a little wait time while you can look at that while things are coming around. Now being provided with um, a document, if you're looking at the um, 
Cape Elizabeth Special Education Program Historic Enrollments. And you are seeing these, these numbers are provided by child count, which is required by the State Department of Education. And you see these numbers have, um, are documented here from the year 2006 through the year 2015. And they're broken out by disability levels and identifications. Um, you will notice that the numbers for multiple disabilities were significantly high in the years 2009, 10, 11, and 12, began to reduce in 2013. Um, upon my entry into this district and, ha and beginning of reviewing IEPs as part of an IEP team, it became evident that the way the district had been identifying young people with multiple disabilities um, had hit a bump in the road and um, the un had been misunderstood and so some of those identifications were um, then corrected and um, that's what you see the reduction in, there was not a reduction of students going anywhere or a reduction of services taken away. They were misidentifications um, and they are well documented in every piece of paperwork that is um, always kept on, on special education youth and reviewed significantly with moms and dads who um, understood and actually were quite happy with that from what they reported to me. Do you want us to ask questions as we go? Do you want to? That might no. be easier because no. you, you're going no. to end up with a lot of data here. So um, feel free. I'm not. Jean, can I ask a question? Will you repeat that last statement? I, I missed it. So the I through? Multiple disabilities? Yes. So multiple disabilities, technically the term means you have to have two disabilities that you can't determine which is a primary and which is a secondary. And essentially, if you had more than one disability during this time frame that Jane has referenced, you were identified as having multiple disabilities as opposed to having a primary disability and a secondary disability. There are cases, as, as is represented here, where it, it is hard to tell which is the, the primary challenge and which might be a secondary challenge. In the majority of cases, as you see represented, and, it, and going back to the 2010-11 numbers, or 11-12 numbers, I'm looking at the, a different chart, the moment, but, but going back to those numbers, that is how students were classified, and there was some misunderstanding of the classification procedures, it appeared, for a window of time. Did that have to do with the law changing or just the practice and like a, a philosophical? I think it was, the law didn't change, I think it was just a misunderstanding on the part of folks who were making those identifications. Okay. I look at this as part of the budget. We're we're trying to take this information and make the following decision. You know, how does this different data uh, provide us with information about assessing the adequacy of resources and instructional support? And I know, um, you know, in terms of the numbers, the total numbers from 2014 to 2015, we have going from 160 to 157. But at the same time, I imagine. Uh, a ch you know, f children with autism have, and I apologize for parents that have children with autism, and I may not use the correct vernacular, but th then they may have greater, you know, service intensity than a child that has, um, you know, speech and needs some assistance with some, you know, pronunciation. So if you're a school board member and you're trying to assess, you know, the different service intensities by, I think these are called, um, not diagnosis, but exceptionalities, mm -hmm. um, you know, how would we be able to look at this and assess and say, well, autism's, the uh, exceptionalities or IEP are the same, you know, so is there a way, um, you know, we could say, well, if you have more of these three types, that's greater in service intensity, that'll take a teacher more time, you know, is there any, I would say no. Okay. Every child with a disability is an individual child with a disability whose individual needs are different one to the other. That's why they have individualized education plans. There are types of services that you may see as more necessary as our population of children with autism has increased and you see from 15 in 2006 to 29 in 2015. 
Children with autism need, in addition to occupational therapy types of services, as they're dealing with sort of processing, sensory processing um, is, a, is a piece of that disability. They're also dealing with communication, because communication is a significant challenge for, for most children with autism. So, so you see similar trends in staffing. We've increased our speech language services as that population of students has grown. In terms of intensity, again, it's really much more individualized. Our population of students with emotional disabilities was 15 in 2006. It is now six. Again, the, the types of needs of those children, those are children who require consistent support and intervention in, with respect to their behavior, most generally. It's not always acting out behavior. It's often internal, internalized behavior as opposed to the externalized acting out behavior you may think of. Um, so again, you, you see the services reflected in the changes that you see in the population over time. And again, every year special education looks different. Uh, partway through some years special education looks different. It's because we have the obligation, no matter when it is, to meet the needs of the children in our schools. And then maybe uh, one more just to frame it. Um, you know, in 2012, there were 180 total IEPs. Um, and I don't know how it's broken down by school, and we're down to 157. So one way you'd say, well, the number of students receiving IEPs has declined. So one could argue, you know, you need, you know, instructional support demand is lower, but at the same time, those students are still in the school system. So they may not be, have an IEP, or a large portion of them, but they're in the classroom. Um, so even though a child may not have an IEP, but if they're, you know, they may need had an IEP first, second, third grade, well, they have eight more years of school left, they may have needs that aren't as an IEP, in other words, the regular classroom teacher has greater demand, you know, so I try to understand balancing those. So I, so I think there's, there's always a population of kids who haven't been identified and or who may have previously been identified. That, that always ebbs and flows, just as the population of students with disabilities ebbs and flows. At the same time, our population overall as a district is trending down. So, and as is our, you know, our population of students uh, with instructional support needs, with special educational needs, has, has trended down a bit as well. I would say, yes, there are always children who aren't identified for special education who have needs. I don't think there's a significant change um, in that group. We have students who leave, we have students who move in. Some years, 13 kids might graduate who have special educational needs, and only five or six might come in to kindergarten. Other years, that fluctuates. And I have one last one, and I know we need to go through the remainder, but, you know, looking at the data, we're trying to make a, a decision on resources, and, you know, you may look at relationships. So, you know, speech and language impairment went from, you know, 12 in 2010, and it's going to be 12 in 2015. And then you'd say we have, you know, double the amount of speech and language therapists. So someone who knows nothing about this would say, well, if you have 12 students and you have four speech and language therapists, you know, that would be, uh, you know, three to one ratio. I'm trying to understand, you know, even though they're not, IEP doesn't say speech and language impairment, I imagine someone that has autism may have speech and language. So how do we... That's a good segue into communication. <laughs> that is a great... Um, in certain, you're absolutely right, uh, Michael, that young people who are identified as having autism, um, do have significant communication needs, and let's see if we pass that out yet. No. Okay, so we do have a handout that Page is five. really long, um, and so you're, I'm not reading it to you, and we're not going to get through all of that right now, but page five. Um, page five of the handout coming to you does address at great length, but, um, I hope in depth for you, um, the purpose of four speech and language pathologists. So speech and language <coughs> identification, um, the numbers are 12, and those young people have significant either, um, very few have significant articulation, and most of them have language disabilities. They also, also the other population of young people who would require speech and language services um, 
and as they age, increase more, um, would be the group of young people with language-based learning disabilities. So, for example, a young person with autism at the high school level who's taking physics and algebra um, and English class spends a significant amount of time with the speech and language pathologist working on the language of those courses and the understanding of the vocabulary, um, the ability to communicate in those classes, understand the nuances of what's going on in those classes. And those young people are very successful because they have that speech and language support. That takes a significant amount of time. They spend more time with the speech and language pathologist in many cases than they do with a special educator. Yeah. Does that help? It does. I know you have a lot to go through, so I don't know if... So uh, maybe I'll highlight what you have, and then if yeah. there's something specific someone wants to ask about, would that be helpful? So, um, <coughs> do you have a question? Oh, I'm sorry. I'll, that's right. I'll oh, follow, I'm sorry. follow Jane, and then I, I, bet I may not have the same question by the end. Okay. So the document that had on the back, we were just looking at the historical data for um, years 2006 through to 2015. If you want to turn that over and look at the complete opposite side of that, um, you have been provided with the um, current staffing, their identification as a speech and language pathologist, for example, a teacher. Um, you also have occupational therapy, physical therapy caseloads here. These are IEP man case management caseloads. So for example, um, t a, a teacher may indeed have eight on her, his or her caseload, and that means that they are the case manager of the IEP process and the re responsible for the IEP paperwork for compliance, and they manage that process. They may teach that young person. They also may be teaching maybe 12 to 13 students during a day. They may see other students who are not identified as part of their IEP caseload. I'm sorry, Jen, is that in addition to their caseload or just overall? That's in addition to their teaching okay. responsibility. They may teach other children. So, for example, I would be managing a caseload of eight, but I might, if I were teaching math in a resource room, I might have three or four other students who weren't on my paperwork caseload come in to me and we would do math. Just because that happened to be what you're teaching that day and that's what those kids because might I'm, need and it's an yes. efficiency. Right. Great. Thank right. you. And it makes sense for the students and the grouping. Quick, quick clarification too, Jane. Is there ever a case where a case manager doesn't work directly with that child? There is a case of that. We try not to have that happen. But we have also tried very, very hard to, to equalize these because this is a, paperwork is a, a lot of responsibility and a lot of work. And so we don't want um, one teacher to say, and we have some very magnanimous special educators who will say, just, I'll take care of it. And pretty soon they're taking care of 20 sets mm -hmm. of paperwork. And that really isn't um, the best use of their time. So we work really hard not to have. And when we discover that, that it makes sense to shift, we shift case managers. The next three pages um, offer you information in a graph format for school. Two pages, we'll see what we've got. Case manager information, um, high school, middle school, and Pong Cove for a date as of 3-13-15. Um, can you um, help me explain or understand the case manager information um, graph as opposed to the IE paperwork information graph? What are those two things measuring? They look I, I wonder, they look like they've been printed twice on the same thing. They're the same piece of they're the same graph. Okay. I don't know why they put Josh on here twice, but they are. This is all about paperwork, and it's just a visual. Okay. Because the you. case manager does do the IEP paperwork. Yes. Yes. That makes sense. Yes. And so, yes, they do do the IEP paperwork. So ultimately, they, the case manager, are responsible. But quite honestly, all of our young people have teams of special education staff working with them. It would be a rarity that there is a student that just has a, one special education staff person working with him or her. So teams of special educators are communicating regularly with 
each other as well as mom and dad about IEP development. Draft IEPs are provided to moms and dads prior to the meeting so that they have a, a document to look at so we have something to talk about. So ultimately in the end the case manager <coughs> is responsible to make sure everything on that paperwork is done and ready to go and provided to mom and dad. Thank you. You have three documents, uh, three graphs in this handout that show you the least restrictive environment. <coughs> which um, refers to as well um, inclusion or young people spending, how much time they're spending in special education and how much time they're spending in general education. We know that the spirit of the special education law idea, individual, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, is that young people are served in the least restrictive environment. It's always a challenge to have those conversations about what makes sense. Do I take him or her out of a classroom? Or do I go into the classroom? What makes sense for each child is very, very different. Susanna? Yeah, I just want to understand the, the graph. You, you say, I'm just trying to understand how to read it. Um, Which so one like is restrictive one? environment? I yeah, the LRE. We can start with any of the schools, yeah, the so high school, middle at, school. If you look at the high school one, which is at the top of the page, mm -hmm. on the far left is the 100% column. Yep. That means that you have one or two children, small print, so I can't tell you, who spend 100% of their day in the regular education uh, classroom, general education classroom. Okay. You have about... 12 or 13 who spend 90 to 99% of their day in the general education classroom. Okay. You have 21 who spend 80 to 89%. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Just didn't know how to read it. Yep. It, it took me a minute. Yeah. This is a lot. I mean. but, but that information, I think, goes back to your earlier question a little bit, Michael, in terms of um, intensity of services. For, for lack of a better term, it doesn't, it doesn't tell you what type of disability a particular student might have, but it tells you what kinds of special education support they're needing, what level of support they're needing. So, you know, the, the five students at, at the high school are spending roughly 50%, up to 50, 0 to 50% of their day, um, only 0 to 50% of their day in general ed. So that means they're spending the other half of their day or up to half of their day in the special education environment. So that's a, that's a more intensive need, obviously. But if we look at this historically, would it really help us too much? Because I guess it would matter what their exceptionality is. It's the mix of the students is as important as the total number. Well, in this case, what matters is the decisions that IEP teams make for individual students. Mm -hmm and to what is the least restrictive environment for them to receive their learning and instruction. So we could chart this, I suspect, for years on end, but right. you're going to see fluctuation. Jane, this is, um, there's the budget question, mm -hmm. um, which we're, we're analyzing the data, and then there's the human element of what happens when five days in a row on Mondays, a student who's in the least restrictive environment um, has, you know, isn't having their best day and so therefore needs to go out mm -hmm. of the classroom with a one-on-one um, -on -one or to another environment for their, for in, into another setting. Mm -hmm. How do parents who are upset, you know, who know their child is coming home and has had a bad day, how do they get in contact with and hear about that issue? And, hear, and I know it's not budgetary, but what we're talking about is, is are we covering enough, do we have enough uh, people, funds, and um, services to take care of the child who's in need? If, um, so, so the real question is, how does communication flow through the regular ed teacher and the um, special ed teacher so that if parents, if parents are aware of what's going on and if parents disagree, is there an ability for them to question the I, you know, to question the teacher, both teachers? That process is 
So um, right now you're looking to, to better understand what happens if things aren't working. Exactly. How does how is that communicated? How does that communication go back? Yeah, forth? and I know like on numbers, obviously we get it on draft, but in real time it looks a little different by week by week, as you said, Meredith. It flows. We're always uh, there's a flow. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'll speak to the, I can't speak to the general educators, and I'm going to ask my colleagues to speak to that, but special educators, I um, would say to you that I pulled some um, of our concerns, I pulled some email communication. So special educators communicate in this way. They um, communicate certainly at IEP meetings, they attend parent conferences with general educators. They communicate by email, they communicate on the phone. Certainly moms and dads are in and out of school all day because that's the culture in this district. Um, the s seven to 10 um, student communication logs that I pulled demonstrated any, friend. I, I pulled email from September 2nd through uh, March 17th and the numbers ranged from 200 emails back and forth. Um, I read those, and those were parent would write to, to educator. That was responded to in every situation within 24 hours with the exception of on weekends and on February vacation. Those were responded to on Sunday nights. We had, I also found staff responding who were home on sick leave. Other, um, so 200 was one. Um, the others were in the 300 to 350 range. That's 350 communications back and forth between September 2nd and March 17th. Um, when asked, uh, when I asked um, special educators what else they do for um, communication, several of them are having regular meetings either on a weekly basis or on a monthly basis with parents. Parents are joining team meetings. They're welcome there. Um, so these kinds of communications are ongoing. If a young person's having a tough day, the special educator is immediately in touch with the parent. They, um, those moms and dads have had very significant communication um, back and forth. There is enough staff that to work with young people when they're having a tough day. Um, yes, it's messy. It's not really simple. Like, come with me, sweetheart, and we'll figure it out, and then go sit down um, and go back to class. This is hard work, and it's not easy to um, turn that behavior around in many cases quickly. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not happening and people aren't working with it. Does that help? Yeah, that's help. And then can I do a follow-up? Yeah. Yes. Then, so the next question is, if there is a discrepancy or an issue, then I assume like all protocols, if a, if a, a teacher, uh, if a student, if a parent is not um, happy, happy, content with yeah. their, yeah. Um, yeah. what's happening, do they talk to the teacher? And then if there's not a response or a difference, then they go to directly to the uh, Building, building principal. Building principal, because the building principals in most IEP meetings. Yes. And so there's always an administrator, either a building principal, an assistant principal, or myself at an IEP meeting. Every IEP correspondence, as required by regulation, uh, provides parents with a very long document of procedural safeguards. But what that really means is, if you're not happy, tell us and we'll sit down with you. If you're not happy and we can't resolve it, there is a, a, resol a conflict resolution process. You can certainly sit with the superintendent or you can go directly to the State Department of Education. It is my responsibility to help moms and dads with that process and I'm more than happy to. Our job is to resolve the conflict and to work on um, what people need and what students need. Um, that doesn't mean that we always are going to agree. And so that process is sometimes very helpful. And so when the parents don't agree, so that it's also documented and then it's brought forward in another a more intensive IEP process mm -hmm. or because as we know, there's, um, uh, there's a, compli a compliance issue right. and we are called on. Um, and I, in recently have we had 
and I'm not trying, I'm, not, I'm going down this to find out how to support the data because mm -hmm. we used to ask the question years ago, um, how many law, law um, cases do we have? Uh, right here. So right. I do have that for you somewhere in one of these handouts. <coughs> Page six of your page six of the, of the same long point. handout. Um, you have a summary of the due process complaints. You can find this. Anyone can find this on the State Department of Special Education, and I provided you with the website. Um, you will find complaints that were formally filed, and you will see a list. Of, if you pull up a year, you see a list of all the school departments where there was a formal complaint or a due process hearing. What you won't find are mediations. Mediations are confidential, and they are um, held between school departments, parents, and there is a mediator provided by the State Department. Those are signed off as confidential. They are placed in individual special education files as a record, but they are not discussed or disclosed in any setting. So those don't show up on the State Department of Education's website. So. Um, you can see that in 2009 there was a complaint, 2011 a complaint. Um, in 2013 there was a due process hearing in which this district prevailed. In 2014 there was an appeal to that and the district continues to, continued to prevail. That's the only information that I was able to find. James, yes. can, can, um, I just want to close the loop on Kate's question about the protocol. In, you know, just so it's known, um, okay, it's not known. Let's say, for example, the administrator at the IEP meeting is not you, and, and the parent wants to, you know, ad address a, an issue. So they first go to the teacher, right? Mm -hmm. This is the protocol, chain of command, teacher, and then the <coughs> school administrator, or do they go, that, that would be the next person? And then after the school administrator, they go to you or to superintendent? To me. To you. Okay, and then from there, superintendent. Okay. So if, a, if there's an IEP meeting and I'm not there and there's a different administrator and the team can't reach agreement, yeah. then usually what is said, well, let's take a break. Let's call our director. And this is a common practice in any school system. It's not just Cape Elizabeth. And let's try it again mm -hmm. and try to figure it out. Okay. So. And that, that's not a frequent happening, but it happens. And, and I, I think probably the, the, the toughest part of this is that these are all very personal, emotional discussions because it's about someone's child. And so um, sometimes that little bit of space and then time to talk again is a, a good thing. Mm -hmm. I would just add that that is the difference between special education education and general education and that because special education is a legal requirement, mm -hmm. not that general education isn't, I don't mean to suggest that, but the individual education plan is a legal requirement and as a result of that there's a specific complaint, hearing, uh, due process um, procedure that, that is set up under the law um, for people to be able to follow. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, I thought we were going to wait to the end, but I guess not. Um, if I understand it correctly, uh, based on the data you've shown us, very little has got, if any, has got to the level of you or our superintendent, maybe a couple cases a year at most. Correct. And all the rest of them have been resolved. Correct. And are you allowed at various levels to go directly to arbitration or mediation, whichever you call it? So mm -hmm. the, the chain may not be vertical, it may be horizontal. Mm -hmm. And arbitration or mediation, which is it? Just help First mediation. comes mediation. There is an arbitration component, but rarely that happens in special education. Okay, so if people pick, instead of going up the food chain, and they decided somehow the school system isn't going to support them, they can go into uh, mediation. They can that, immediately call the State Department, yes. And is that done by somebody outside the school system, the mediator? Yes, the State Department of Education provides a mediator. It's a formal process. Okay. About on average, how much do we in a year go to mediation? I've been to mediation twice in my tenure here. In your ten years, three to four Since years? Since I've been here, it's three and a half years. So this doesn't sound like a bad uh, process. Either it gets resolved, it really gets to the very top, and very few of them even get mediated in maybe one lawsuit a year. 
not even one a year, but one in the time in three and a half years, yes. Okay, thank you. Can you remember what the lawsuits were like prior to your, I mean, how many? I what can. Was the well, I, I, the only data I have is the t what's on the State Department of Education. I, and again, I would have privilege to see the file that would have mediation documentation in there that might be historical. So, but, but I'm not allowed to talk about that. I'm not going to ask. But is it fair to say that uh, hopefully our performance metric isn't based on how many times we've been sued? I, I mean, that's <laughs> the liability part of it, but... Um, well, actually, it does show whether or not it gets resolved informally with the team right. or it goes and very little even make, makes it to mediation. So it is an indicator of how well we're doing. Not, if it goes to litigation, it may be that we did a bad job and somebody prints a lawsuit, and I, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about in the past, won or lost various ones, but um, it sounds to me like there is a benchmark here, and we're doing fairly well at it. Well, it's one benchmark. Right. Well, well the only benchmark we have is people are, are resolving it amicably, it's getting resolved amicably. Rarely is it even going to mediation. That is an indicator. A pretty good one. So I would also share with you that um, from the federal um, accountability report in the 2011-2012 special education graduation rate for us is 99% and the general education rate that year was 96%. In 2012-13, the special education graduation rate was 99% and the general education rate was 97%. I don't have any further data on that. That would be great to sh if we could get that. That's, mm -hmm. um, so I know it would be hard for us to read the uh, behavioral needs and intervention strategies, but it, obviously that's an area of, of discussion. Um, so, so let's, um, I can give you a quick, a short version of that if it's helpful. Um, and there's historical data here. So in, in 2010 through 2012, this district contracted with a company called Safety Care for BCBA services. That company provided training, hands-on training for teachers to help them learn how to manage behavior. And that um, service also was a BCBA contracted service consultant who came into specific classrooms uh, um, a few hours a week. For a general or a special ed? Special ed. This is all special okay. education. In 2012 through 2014, three staff persons, two special educators and one psychologist, worked toward their BCBA credentials. The district provided support and supervision for that, formal supervision with a PhD level staff person. One BCBA passed the exam and obtained the credential in 2014 of spring and last year left as a result of a reduction in staff. The second achieved that credential in the summer of 2014 and remains with us, that is our psychologist. The third educator had completed the coursework and was not, um, had not taken the test and that is the educator who has moved on to the administrative position. In 2014-15, the district um, has, as, as you know, a BCBA psychologist. We've also had a consultant, consulting psychologist who's skilled in autism, and a second consulting um, autism expert is now working with us. The current autism consultant um, began with us early in March, and as the year is shaping up differently in her schedule, she's going to be able to give us more time. The projection for the coming year should be, and I, uh, as you know, will not have control of that, but I will leave a recommendation that that um, person continue to work with the district a couple days a week, and she also is um, providing me with a professional development proposal that would be an ongoing um, opportunity for our staff to learn. Can I just ask a clarify that uh, the way it's worded, it I was just trying to understand, like in 2012, 2014, it says there were three staff. I assume two, two of those were special educators. One was a psychologist. They're all so special there were two teachers. And a, so when it says it worked toward BCBA credentials, 
in other words, from 2012 to 2013, we had two special ed teachers and one psychologist that focused on behavioral needs and interventionist strategies? No, they, they all focused on <coughs> getting their credentials to be a BCBA, which is important to them. They also were skilled at working with young people with behaviors, no question about that. Right, but it, it, if someone's working toward their credentials, you know, whatever a teacher may be working toward, that might be for development, but what are they actually doing? In other words, were these, from 2012 to 2014, do we have two teachers and one psychologist that were focused on behavioral needs and interventions? That was additional <coughs> learning. That was their additional professional learning because that was a, an area of the field that they really enjoyed working with, had skill set working with, and so yes, during, during that time they certainly were working with children. But I'm saying it would be like if I had they someone... only working with children with mm -hmm. behavior? It's not like so, if I had question? someone working that I, you know, they were an uh, engineer and I said, oh, they're, I would say they were engineer. I wouldn't say, or I could say they're working on their credentials. And functionally, were these two special education psychologists, was their functional role, I don't care, you know, I, I understand. Their functional role was special education teacher, right. two of them. Two of them. The so other's functional role was psychologist, and psychologists do evaluations, right. they provide consultation, they develop behavior plans and do functional behavioral assessments. The special education teachers teach, right. and some of that instructional time was also coaching behavior, yes. Well, can I yeah. just clarify, because yeah. I've read this. All, it, it's just to answer your question, you're getting tripped over the word functions or primary or what they are. All these people do behavioral uh, work with behavior. All special ed people have training in behavioral difficulties. In fact, the classroom teachers have training in behavioral things. So we've got three sets of people working on behaviors, uh, at least. Every IS person has training in it. There are some people with highly specialized training in it, and teachers have training in it. Just so you know, they, they, they may be called a psychologist, but they have special, they have behavioralist training. So that every ed tech, every IS person has this training, and a lot of the teachers do as well. And I, I appreciate that. I know everyone could be trained to do something, but with, there might have been two people that were trained or untrained, but they were ex did a great job and were perceived or used as <coughs> behavioral specialist and then you go from 14, 15. I don't think that that's what that copy says. I think it merely says that there were three staff people who were Clean. going towards working for their BCBA credentials and, but why is that as significant? professional development right. opportunity for them. Uh, on I top of it. Because there was a specific question from the board, was there a job description for a behavioral strategist? And the answer is no, because there oh, okay. is no such okay. job. The job is special educator. Thank you. The job is psychologist. Right. The job okay. is board certified behavior analyst, which we had received on a consultative basis until we were trying to, to grow that capacity internally. And I, if I can just clarify from, from what I understand, so of the three, one, you know, one left uh, or had to be cut in 2014, or is that right? That was a reduction. A reduction, sorry. With the budget, correct. Um, and then uh, another one uh, who, who, who completed her credentials uh, but was a teacher um, who happened to be m maybe before or not m maybe because of her credentials but maybe not, it happened to be very skilled in mm -hmm. behavioral management. And that was one of her strengths. And then she chose to leave to go into an administrative position. That leaves the psychologist who, who we have on staff who is credentialed in that, so can advise, but doesn't have as much interaction, direct interaction as a special ed teacher. Is that right? Correct. Right. She's not teaching the children. Right. Plus, do I remember she was on maternity leave this and year? She's on family leave, and she's working with us 10 hours. She has agreed to give us additional hours given the concerns that have been surfaced. Um, so she will be providing additional hours specifically to the Pong Cove School. And um, we also have the autism consultant. What I was trying to show, Michael, is that when I came here, the district had a BCBA and a consultative model. Okay. And so we have maintained that, and we continue to maintain that. And 
There's a couple reasons why that, that may be a wonderful thing in many ways, and then in other ways it's a challenge. So the positives of that are that you have someone who's very skilled and specific and has the time to work with not only <coughs> special educators, but general educators, administrators if needed, and also um, work with children to model for those staff people so that they can learn the skills and carry them on. The negative part of that is that that person isn't here every day, all day, doing the work with the children. And that is the difference in that model. One is a consultative, I'll teach you, I'll help you, I'll give you suggestions, I'll model for you. And ultimately it is our special educator's responsibility to learn to do that. Um, they are spending the time with children all day long, every day. <coughs> The, the, the downside of that is seen by many is that they're not the person in the trenches doing the work. We've learned that doing the work is awesome, but doing the work doesn't help our colleagues evidently because our colleagues have worked with the person that everyone is revering and I, I do too. Um, but the takeaways from working beside someone hasn't been as impactful as we'd hoped. And so the consultative model that was in place and continues to be in place may indeed be more helpful in that way to help some of our staff grow and learn. The staff is um, eager and are expressing to me, at least, when they speak to me, that this is a positive um, forward movement and they're, they're pleased with the re services they're receiving at the moment. Could I ask a question, please, just to understand your charts on page two. Oh, oh. You didn't. You didn't read oh, the text. No. <coughs> Sorry, Dave. Vetoed by the camera. No, no, I don't want. I don't want more of that stuff. I'm tempted. Ready for another? Sure. The camera's back on. Are you taping? Yes, he is. I'm waiting for them to look at me. They're I'm not. sorry, is it done? Yeah, it's, I it's apologize. Right. That's okay. No, you're doing um, a fantastic job. Thank you for all your help. Um, I think it would be helpful for me if you explain the consultative position versus the immersive position or whichever. But um, again, but before you do that, on pages two and three of the material you provided, I'm, I'm a bit confused. Are you on, on this one, Dave? Yes, the big one. Uh -huh. Page two and three. Two you have a comparison of 2014 to 2014-15 to 2015-16. And the way I look at it, my math is not one of my strengths. Going down each one, we stay the same on instructional strategies K through eight. We go up one more special educator. We lose one ed tech. We stay the same on occupational therapists. We stay the same on physical therapists. We stay the same on speech and language pathologists. We go up one on psychological services district wide from one to two. Um, well, one plus some contracted hours. And then the major difference is for some reason you have a behavioral services BCBA for each school that looks like we have one in each school, but in fact we don't. We don't. Okay. okay. But we are going to a model where we have a psychologist serving K through 12, and that's one psychologist that's serving? One with, psychologist is a BCBA. BCBA. We have two psychologists serving right. K-12. One is on leave, as we've said, this year, and is providing us with now well, she currently is 10, but has agreed to provide us with more hours. Well, looking at the difference on BCBA, we last year got about 10 hours contracted for each of the schools, except this high year. school. Uh, we have this, this year. year, sorry, yeah. yeah. Uh, plus um, one to two days per week in the high school. And we basically have the model where we're going to have uh, a full-time psychologist who has BCBA for each of the three schools plus contracted uh, hours as needed. Correct. So what I tried to show here is that, that we have, we currently have 10 hours of our school psychologist who is 
the BCBA on family leave. She works with us 10 hours, and she does have one young person at the high school that she's responsible to see, and she has provided service, is not right now, but has provided some consultation to the middle school. Most of her time is being spent at the elementary school. Addition to that, we have now contracted with another outside provider who is an autism specialist, also a BCBA, a PhD level, and she is coming in one day a week. Her initial placement is, is simply at Pond Cove. When she's able to give us more time, we will expand her work right now for the remainder of this school year to the middle school as well. There are no needs at the high school. Okay, but so next year, does that help? That's where it's going. Go ahead. Okay. Next year, that psychologist who's on family leave is returning full time. So she has BCBA credentials and ability to work K-12. So there is someone available K-12 next year who is in our district full time. In addition to that, my recommendation is to your future um, director that he or she contract for two days a week with the current autism specialist that we have to focus specifically on the needs of those young people um, that are being served this year and that will continue to need to be served next year and in a consultative model. So Does being that help? somewhat simple, we go from 10 hours per school, 30 hours, to mm -hmm. a full-time psychologist with BCBA, which presumably she works about 40 hours a week, plus consultative services. So. If my math is correct, we're going up in behavioral services, the expert behavioral specific services for next year versus this year. Well, we will because of the, the additional con consultant, the autism specialist. Mm -hmm. And certainly we having our psychologist <coughs> back full time will be helpful. Right. But she has other responsibilities <coughs> other than behavior. Okay. And quite frankly, we don't have as many behaviors to fill a full time person's, I mean, to have them do nothing else but that. So her responsibility, in addition to BCBA or behavior support for teachers and children, um, are the basic evaluation processes that are required by special education. OK, that's a good clarification. So in other words, we have available mm -hmm. one full-time person, but Correct. she has other tasks. Yes, we'll, so we're If we have problems, we will still buy consulting services. and. Um, um, so we have, we'll provide at least the same amount of services next year as we do this year? Well, there'll be additional services next year. Okay. Uh, I mean, I have no control over that, but that is my recommendation. Okay. That, that, um, that is the conversation that I've had with the consultant currently, the autism specialist. And as I said, the other thing that I would strongly suggest happen is that she provides some very targeted professional development for our special education staff who are asking for that um, and seem quite ready to receive that. I think that um, the more that people can learn and be able to take away and then share with their regular education colleagues about autism and working with our young people will be helpful. So in other words, we'll po possibly have more people more specifically trained in behavior if, if they follow your recommendation. For that should be the goal, yes. Okay. Thank you. On the, um, so at, at a certain time there was someone, you know, I know they're not called behavior specialists, but, um, you know, uh, you know, you know, if there's 50 odd classes, middle school in Pond Cove, you know, we've received some email, you know, a teacher needs assistance and one common thread is, you know, I don't know the name of it, but it used to be someone would, you know, immediately be available to help out. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to understand, you know, um, there appeared to be some sort of change. Now, I mean, the number of people may not have changed, but the, the way we, you know, deal with it sounds like it changed, and that's the part I'm trying to better understand. There might have been someone great that was working toward it and just became known as the person that is fantastic in this position. So. Um, my thought is, you know, we, you know, you hire positions, and you you never really know who the person's going to be. 
but um, you, know, you mentioned I understand the consultative approach that you teach everyone to do it better, but um, you know what is there during transition is there a um, you know saying well we hope the consultative approach works, but during this transition um, how could a, a you know could there be a person that's re you know that's their role that's the disconnect um, mm -hmm. so there's a couple things um, one is um, most of our special education staff some are not but most of our special education staff are trained in crisis prevention intervention our superintendent provides that training um, so that's one piece, and that would be an amazing opportunity for many of our general educators because it's not all about just hanging on to people. It's really about how to interact and how to um, manage and prevent many behaviors. So that's another professional opportunity that others could take part in. Um, at the moment, there is a go-to person. The person that, w that you're referring to that left was a very, uh, again, revered and loved educator and had been here a long time and made a choice. What she said to me specifically was, I'm going for something. I'm not leaving because of something. Others will tell you differently, and I, can't, I am not going to go there. Um, but that was someone who everyone really respected and loved. So that when she left, there was a, a great void felt. The reality is that there are other special educators, and there is one at Pond Cove that is the go-to person right now. And, and that person is well trained, that person is doing a great job. The young people that um, initially had some rather significant challenges um, are settling in much better now. So it's not that we have just said, well, someone left and we're not doing anything, gosh, too bad, um, and turned our backs. That, that continues to be, um, that those children continue to be served. So. Not to oversimplify, mm -hmm. but we have received emails, please don't cut the behaviorist position. Mm -hmm. So simply stated, there really is no one behaviorist position. There's it not. is a, 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 a unilateral team of folks in each building mm -hmm. who are, we are growing and increasing their capacity, as well as people who are already there who are trained. Exactly. To intervene. Yes. So there's just one more little tiny piece. Um, David, you, you started down this road. And so let's look at the Pong Cove staffing for this current year. And let's look at the Pong Cove staffing for um, projected for 2015-16. Can you tell me which one of you are here now? Um, they look, they look like this. The one that says compliance data on the front. Yep. That's the one I was trying to so you'll see that the, the number of special educators currently at Ponco School are five, and then one and a half, and you know we have all the support personnel, but we're not going there right now. That's on page two. That's on page two, at the top. You have to have them side by side. I know, it's easy to take it apart. Take it apart. Um, we killed a lot of trees, but we saved some. Um, you will see that the projection now, after discussion with my colleagues at the administrative team level, is that there will be six special educators that's where at Pong Cove. Yeah. Do you see that? Yeah, it's where I got the plus one. I didn't So a little comparison. The conversation is that we um, will look K-12 at the staffing model, and um, the plan would be that there would be four special educators at the high school, four at the middle school, and six at the elementary school in order to um, have a higher number of professional staff who would be able to support and interact with children, general educators, um, to support young people with, who may have behavioral needs. We do have staff in other places who have skills. I have made no decisions and am not going to have any conversations about the who at um, at this point because we're still in the processes of looking at student needs and, and um, making those decisions. So in addition to our psychologist returning full time next year who has some time during her week to provide behavioral support, we also will have 
contracted services of the autism specialist who is currently with us, and that will be increased. That person will be providing professional development for that staff specifically at Pond Cove, but I'm hopeful that our um, middle school and high school staff will also partake. And um, we will have an additional special educator assigned to the Pond Cove school so that, um, Joe, in response to your summary, there is there are more people to go to and respond to when um, support is needed. Right. Just one thing, and this is, uh, there's positions or, you know, you can have budgeted positions. You know, we could have 10 budgeted positions and we had 10 last year and we could have 10 this year. Mm -hmm. Those are positions. And then you have uh, staff, like, you know, if I have 10 and 10, if eight of them are filled <laughs> and, you know, and so one thing I'm trying to reconcile is on this first one, it has teachers, special ed goes from, uh, on the staffing one. Mm -hmm. So it says we go from 15 to 14. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, the 15th for this year, one is currently unfilled. unfilled. That was left so in terms of people, on. so going from 15 to 14, it would really say, no, we, we would go from 15 instructional support, or, I'm sorry, 14 instructional support teachers, and then for 15, 16, there would be 14 instructional support teachers. And then on this sheet where it says 2014-15, we call them special educators. Mm -hmm. And is that synonymous with teachers? Well, yes. that we have five, four, and three. That adds up to 12. So then you have an instructional strategist, K-8, who's a special educator. I broke that out because that person okay. does not carry a caseload. That person's responsibility is K-8 to manage the IEP process, communicate with people, um, communicate regularly with staff, administration, and families. Okay, so that would, uh, but then we already have one on here for, is that the same one on here for instructional strategies? Yeah, you just have one. Right, so you, in other words, if we add teachers and instructional strategists, 14 and one is 15, next year we'll have 14 and one, that's 15 and 15. Mm -hmm. And on this one, we have five special educators, five plus four is three is 12. And if I add instructional strategies, that gets me to 13. That's why you are the finance guy. So we're yeah. still missing some. So I'm confused, but I don't know what the question is, Michael. Well, he's, he's coming up with two different those. numbers. Yeah, just in terms of staffing. No, there's four currently. I thought it was the psychologist was off on a leave. No, just let her answer the question. Does that count as the? No, we're not counting Let her the answer the question. It's easier. So what, what uh -huh. we, yeah. So what we want to know is if it's going to be uh, 14 to 14 in a year. Right. So my math is wrong. Am I missing somebody, special educators? Oh, at the high school. Yeah. Typo. Right. And then we have is 14. And then the open position made 15. Right. So, Michael, you, thank you. Yep. Um, on this current year, I apologize, my typo, special educators mm -hmm. at Cape Elizabeth High School should be four. Okay. So there's one. We have For a full time. 14, 15? Yep. We have a full time strategist, as you see that showing. Oh, um, okay. At that's the another school. one. And then we have the open position for this year, which makes us 15. Next year it's 14 because. Yes. My recommendation continues to be that that open position doesn't need to be filled. Ultimately, that's your decision. It's not mine. Does that make sense now? I'm sorry. I mean, Al almost. Almost. Okay. <laughs> Try again. Uh, so instructional strat. If we go to 1415, instructional strategist K8 is one. One one person serves both schools. All right. So that's the same person. That's the same person. Yes. Five so. special educators currently at Pong Cove. Right. Four special educators currently at the middle school. Right. But that empty position was a middle school position. So that's the one that's sitting empty. Okay. And then we have four special educators instead of the three that you see. Okay. I really am sorry about that. That's okay. I'm just confusing enough without my goofing up the typing. <laughs> And then for the recommendation for 1516, uh, it's 
hasn't been determined where what the source of the special educator who would be added at Pond Cove. Correct. We have a person on leave this year who's returning to our district, but assignments. That doesn't mean that person is going to Pond Cove. Okay. But that, um, and so you would have em that empty position goes away, but you still will have well, six at Pond Cove, four at yeah. middle, and four at high school. Okay. Uh, Kate's burning over here. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I actually, um, okay. Oh, Barbara's Barbara. burning over there. Yeah. I'm not burning, but I have questions. Thank you. This is a really helpful, granular look, so appreciate that. Um, if I was going to summarize, now that I think I've got the numbers straight, Michael, thanks to your asking. Last year, right now, you were proposing that the Pond Cove person skilled with working with children in autism and challenging behaviors go to the middle school. Then they left for administrative role, and that was left unfilled. And at the same time as things happen in schools, your BCBA person is on leave. Correct. And I, and I would surmise that's a bit of the emotionality around what's happened this year. So at, so at this point, what I think I'm hearing you saying is, despite where you were thinking about it, last year as a position that we probably ought to fill with a similar skill set, you would prefer or you will be proposing that we bring in an outside consultant for a couple days a week instead of filling that full-time position. Is that, Correct. Is that close? Okay. So, and that's, and that's sort of what is facing us in terms of a decision and I guess one of the things that would be helpful to me would be that uh, cost comparison, you know, the cost of an outside consultant with that skill set versus us actually filling that position. Because I think a piece of what we're hearing from folks is uh, in the last time and this time is um, that, that, that vacancy has been sorely felt. And I think that I totally agree with you about skill sets and teachers and ed techs and other people having that background, but I think what I heard folks saying was their children who were in um, having an extremely difficult day, whether it was communication breakdown or whatever, had various different people coming to them without a safe place to go and de-escalate, without feeling like quite the same level of support for safety plans being in place, and that teachers were being pulled out of their teaching in order to respond to crisis. So, so I guess what we have to think about is whether a <coughs> consultant will fill enough of that role or cost comparison wise if it would be better to fill it and try to re replace the skill set you lost. Is that accurate? I think in part I would add you know, one, one element of that in terms of children in crisis and needing to be removed. There are five children district-wide who've required any physical management at all this year. Two at the middle school, one at the high school, and two at Pond Cove. Um, well, it's beyond it, physical management, though. There's just a plain breakdown. So I just want to be yeah. Clear yeah. I didn't mean physical about management. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's 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 the very last straw. I understand that. Yeah. Okay. But there was this. The the, the my point is, last year your sense was that was a needed role at the middle school. You moved this person to the middle school to, 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 assist, to, to continue to play that role. And now as you step back, you're thinking, That's, that one was vacated. Let's not fill it. Let's go the consultant way instead from an outside, highly skilled person. So there's a little more information I can give, but not much because of, of the nature of the work. Um, the, that move of that revered teacher to the middle school was made because the um, and I'm not going to have these numbers exact, but I'm very close. The numbers of young people moving from fourth to fifth last year were about between 16 and 19, and the numbers of prior fifth graders who were now moving into the sixth grade who um, had been um, historically identified at the Pond Cove School as requiring that educator's expertise were within the 15 to 17 range. So there were a large number of young people who, after much conversation with all the special education staff, um, felt that were impacted by this. Certainly the high school wasn't involved in that conversation, but 
um, middle school and elementary were, people felt that that was the best move to support those young people. And the year started out well for those young people, and um, the year continues well for those young people with that position unfilled. You're absolutely correct. There is a great void by that person leaving. Um, and the hiring of a new person might not fill that void, but I can't predict that either. So, um, but no needs have gone unmet. No services are not being provided. We are vigilant about that. We are not in remiss any, in any way. It, it just isn't the same mm -hmm. as it was. Mm -hmm. um, the difference for your budget just, and I don't have the numbers, but there is a difference, and the difference is the position that's empty is funded by the Cape Elizabeth School Department. Um, the consultant is funded by federal funds, local entitlement, so that doesn't impact the Cape Elizabeth School budget. The, I'm going to give you a history of the management of local entitlement funds. If we do that, can I just, I, I wish you'd state this bluntly, if it's true, that, that you anticipated a need in middle school, which is why you put somebody there full time, and that need did not, was not as great as you thought it was going to be. Correct. And therefore, that's why you don't think you need next year, or your best prediction is you won't need a full-time person next year, but somebody on a consultative basis. Correct. Thank you. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. The um, the uh, the the apps uh, the void or whatever the 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 so human being it's an lost. emotional void, lost. not a skill yeah. void. Um, where was the loss felt most? In the middle school or in, the, in Pong Cove? I would suggest K-12. That person was loved by most everyone. And certainly by me, I certainly felt the loss. So no, I guess um, I meant in terms of actuals, like you know, support to the. Kids. Well, the students to missed the, the person. The students were reassigned. We have special educators with all the students at the middle school level, and um, they're being very successful. I, uh, Susan's asking a different question. They're, the it's not a loss in terms of we weren't providing a service. It was provided. It was a loss in the sense that people missed somebody. The service was still provided. That's what we're being told. And it wasn't the same. It just no. couldn't be the same. No, yeah. I, mean, I feel like I feel the like impact of that shift, I would say, was felt most greatly at Pond Cove. It was a transition, and I think that's what Barbara was alluding to. It, 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 yeah. it felt discombobulated for people. Yeah. Different people were taking on roles that maybe they hadn't taken on before because that right. person had always yeah. assumed the role in the past, yeah. and so it... Right. So that's, that helps me understand the rationale of, okay, we moved her to middle school, or him, we moved them to middle school, and um, they left, but actually we're doing okay. It was the initial change, the Ponco change of staffing that piece of it. is the, the, the loss, that fe feels the loss the most. I, I just is would it, clarify so, yeah. that I, I heard not from Pond Cove, um, parents and teachers I heard from middle school. So just shifting back over, I think it was also an anticipated position there that was no longer. And people were then pulled out of their regular special ed teaching in order to deal with crisis. And to I summarize the, uh, to simplify it, um, uh, we have 14 teachers, special educated teachers. We uh, are targeting 14 for next year. Correct. We are saying, well, there's a need at Pond Cove, and so if there's five at Pond Cove this year, there's going to be su the suggestion is to have six next year. So if you have 14 and 14, if you're moving one to Pond Cove, then the natural question, it's going to come from another school. Correct. So uh, if you wanted to sustain the level of teachers at each school and uh, meet, it sounds like a recommendation that Pond Cove needs an additional one. If that were the case, and you would need an additional special ed teacher. There Our administrative an team doesn't think so. But I'm just trying to the mathematics of it. Right. I'm uh, saying okay. our administrative team doesn't think so. The, the administrative team has reviewed this extensively, particularly in light of the concerns that were raised. Um, the middle school feels it's doing okay with the resources that it has. Pond Cove does not feel that it's doing okay, and we're making that adjustment. Okay. And 
we know there can be, um, if, if, as it's fluid, if there is a need, we will change. And if there is a need that, and we have compliance issues and other um, issues, we will make adjustments. Mm -hmm. You have very healthy management of your local entitlement funds that can support the consultant and can support other, oh my, gosh darn, we didn't expect if, if, if someone joins us that wasn't expected. I have one more question. Sure. I, um, I just want to make sure the caseload, the caseloads are in um, compliance or the caseloads are as in special ed schools, every child is different, so they bring a little bit of a different um, time, Man. And, you know, timing, the manpower, hours. But how's the caseload in Cape Elizabeth, Elizabeth versus our other so, surrounding districts? So you asked why there were two copies of one chart, and I, I looked because yes. that, <laughs> that wasn't right. Um, for the other chart Thank that you. should have been provided to you that is open in my email, it's unfortunately none of you can see at the moment, was a, a comparison chart of uh, special education case loads. And again, these are numbers. They don't tell the whole story, but we chose districts that have similar characteristics for that comparison purpose. And, and their special education populations are not dissimilar to ours in terms of um, percentage of students with particular disability classifications. That, that you looked at. So in Falmouth, the number of students per special education teacher is 16.1. Uh, in Yarmouth, it's 9.38. In Cumberland, it's 11.31. In Cape Elizabeth, right now, it's 11.4. And our projection for next year is 9.56. And one of these? Number of students for special education teachers. I, I do have your email. Can you tell me which one it is so we, I can open it for Michael? Well, it should say comparable. Yeah, I, I wrote it down. Comparable. Comparables. Yeah. You know, what, what's the time of your email? So I, that, yeah. I have the chart open, so I, I'm looking at the chart, not at my email, but I will will repost this information. Right, so that's you, I just I to repeat that. I have students per? Per special education teacher. Okay. In Falmouth, 16.1 students per special education teacher. In Yarmouth, 9.38 students per special education teacher. In Cumberland, 11.31 students per special, special education teacher. In Cape Elizabeth, currently 11.4 students per special education teacher. And projected for next year in Cape Elizabeth, 9.56 students per special education teacher. Thank you. All right, I'm sure we, uh, well, um, first of all, thank you for uh, providing this information. And I think uh, in future budget, this same type of information would be extremely helpful. Um, I'm sorry. Thank you very much, Jane. I appreciate all the information that you um, pulled together for us. So, um, for the email, the protocol, you know, if you have, need more information, um, mm -hmm. you know, ask questions or if there's further consideration of, you know, any matters that would have a budgetary impact, um, you know, you can voice those now. Um, I, I, I do, uh, you know, one, I think, uh, you know, keeping a full-time IS director and um, an additional teacher, I would like to further discuss that. And uh, that's yep. Could I ask a question? And I noticed on these charts, it's now gone from a half to a full. Is that? Yep. Can I ask you to explain that? Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> I would love to explain that. That's why it's on there. That's why I'm asking. Um, and it. it um, so again, after our meeting two weeks ago, we as an administrative team met again and said, gosh, what's wrong? Um, because our building administrators hadn't heard this level of concern from parents. They weren't um, hearing this angst. We didn't have a series of complaints. We weren't, we weren't seeing chaos. Um, and yet, that's what's being reported. So as we talked through that and we talked about Again, there were some concerns about behavior at Pond Cove, and, and we looked at how we can 
could shift services to be able to address those. But as we talked about it, it, it seemed that there's a need. <laughs> Something isn't right, and we need to surface what that is. And so we looked as a team at where we might be able to make some shifts um, in order to reinstate that position at a full time. It would be as a special ed director, not as a director of instructional support, which is what we had recommended to you previously, so that the supervision of special educators is shared by building administrators, because I think some of the communication pieces that you hear, heard about, I think relate to they're, the building administrator needs to be equally involved in the process, and I'm not suggesting that they're not, but that, that shared supervision model, I think, is a, is a good model for the practices in special education we're, we're trying to achieve. Um, I, I, I also feel strongly, I feel strongly that a halftime director does have the capacity to meet the needs of the population of students that we have. 150 students for a full-time director is a relatively small number. But given the concerns that we've heard about, I, I think it makes sense to put in a full-time director while we figure it out. What's going on? What training do we need to provide so that general ed staff can address the question of, uh, you know, it, it's, it was very disheartening to hear that comment from a parent, but so that general education staff can address the question of, how's my child doing in your classroom? Every one of us should be able to provide that every student-facing person ought to be able to provide that answer and should know and feel equally responsible for those children in their classrooms. Um, every building administrator shares the responsibility for those children in their schools. We as district administrators share that responsibility for those students across our district. So we need to fix that. Um, and so, again, we looked as a team at where we could make that adjustment. My recommendation would be that the director of special education for next year be placed in the Pond Cove Middle School building to be there on site, seeing what's going on, being able to provide feedback and support and training. Um, because it sounds like things aren't, aren't where they need to be. Can I ask a couple questions? Yes. Is that, are you, are we, you're using a different title now. We have a half-time IS and a full-time, so we're adding a whole person, not a half a person? No, it will be one full-time position that will be called the Director of Special Education because we would still transfer the responsibilities that we talked about at the last meeting, shared supervision model, moving gifted and talented and English language learner responsibilities, oversight for those student programs to the Director of Instruction. So this person will now have a title of special ed director, but they'll be responsible for all 150 kids. Mm -hmm. But they'll be situated at Pond Cove. Pond Cove Middle School. Pond Cove Middle School, okay. Are they going to take a look at what's causing these issues and problems and concerns? It, it may be a matter of training, it may be a matter of some people not doing their job, it may be a lot of things. I, I, I mean, that's, that's the job, is to take a look at what's working, what isn't working, okay. and do what we can to improve it. If I may, so, but ultimately long term, if the problems get fixed, is it possible a year or two from now that we would go to a half-time special ed director? I mean, not half-time, a .5 position. I, I, think you, I think we need to continue to look over time at all of our positions. You know, we, we look at enrollment, we look at trends, we look at need. That's our job on an annual basis. So is it conceivable that that position could be reduced down the line? Absolutely. I think it's conceivable that any position can be reduced down the line. Well, I guess what I'm looking at is I, I, hear, I hear two sides. Everybody should understand we always hear two sides. To every single issue we have, we hear two sides. One is spend the money, one is don't spend the money. One is spend the money over here, not over here. It's a zero-sum game because we have a finite pool of funds and we're allocating among kids. So once one kid gets more, this is all relative, other kids may get less in terms of raw money. So I'm just trying to figure out if originally we didn't think we needed it and now we do because we have problems uh, and we need to fix those problems, I would agree with that. But I also agree with understand that if we're in comparison to other towns, if a half position or a half-time director, and most of the stuff done at the building level and with the special ed people, that this is not necessarily a permanent change. That we still have to be compared against other, other towns and best practices metrics. Is that fair to say? I think that's fair to say. Okay.
Anyone have any further questions at this time? Thank you very much, Jane. I really appreciate Thank the you. thoroughness and the information that you've provided. It's been very helpful. And I also just want to say I, I truly appreciate the hearing from the folks in our community who this impacts and rethinking to sort of take a closer look. It's uh, I, I want to add my appreciation to both of you for the um, huge amount of work you produce in a relatively short period of time doing all the budget stuff. And I appreciate hearing from everybody that has been content on all issues because it's always good to, it isn't uh, good to hear from everybody involved, whether it's staff, administrators, or parents, or taxpayers. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, preschool. So, as you just mentioned, Michael, you hear both sides of every issue, right? And that, that's the role of a school board. Sure. I think I need some chocolate. Okay. Um, I'm hoarding it over here. Keep it over there. Yeah. Okay. She got my special ones, sorry. No, these are special. No, espresso. Oh, oh, no, I want to sleep. If you go to bed, I'll call you at 3 a.m. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so, Mr. Gross cited some research around preschool that says uh, academic gains don't last, and yet he also cited research that said the social emotional gains do last, and they're predictive of future success um, to include graduation and not being incarcerated. Um, and and the research has supported um, that the financial gain for preschool in terms of the impact, it does pay off. It's an investment. Um, you know, the, the children who struggle most when they come to school are the children who come in with the most limited vocabulary. So the children who have had the least exposure um, to reading and writing. And while we as Kate Elizabeth would like to think that doesn't happen here, that happens here. There are children who come to us every year who have not had the opportunity to have a preschool experience. It's not a large number of children, but it happens every year. Uh, and so, uh, you know, our goal in the strategic plan is to close the achievement gap for kids. It's to, uh, you know, help all children achieve success, but, it's, but part of that involves closing the achievement gap. And again, to me, that's largely due to an opportunity gap. So the, the proposal that was in your budget and again, it's been laid out in the strategic plan. It was something that's in the action plan. It was initially proposed for 2016, 2017. And we talked last spring about the fact that the state had opened up um, some possibilities for funding for preschool for next year. But you had to apply this year in order to be eligible for that. Now, of course, the state funding fluctuates every year. And there's no guarantee that there's going to be a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow when you go through, go through those processes. The state does, however, provide some funding for public preschool programs. We also have children with disabilities um, who are, in some cases, getting great services from Child Developmental Services. And in some cases, they're on a wait list, and those services don't appear. Our intent, working with community services, and I've passed out to you a funding guide. <laughs> this is the state's resource. You don't, I'm not expecting you to read it. Thank you. It's not, a, it's not a study document, and you'll hear why shortly. But I, I'm, <laughs> I'm talking about it right now anyway. Um, it's a funding collaboration guide for early care and education partnerships in Maine. The intent is that we could, the intent was to provide a targeted preschool program targeting students with disabilities who might not otherwise be accessing a, a full preschool program, meaning our pre-K program is a 15-hour a week program. Our intent is to target getting those students into that program who might not be attending CDS, who might just be getting some related services. And long-term, our long-term goal is not to provide universal pre-K in Cape Elizabeth. Our long-term goal is to make sure that children who aren't able right now, typically for financial reasons, to access pre-K in Cape Elizabeth have the opportunity to receive pre-K. For us as a district, that's about $5,000 a kid a year. Our free and reduced lunch percentages range from 5 to 7% typically. So you think seven students times $5,000 is a $35,000 investment from this district, essentially a max investment of $35,000 from this district. 
on an annual basis to guarantee that kids who might not otherwise access pre-K have the opportunity to access pre-K. That's my soapbox speech, and I could go on because I have a lot to say about preschool, having seen um, benefits as, um, as an elementary principal, as a district special education director um, for students who had the opportunity to participate in pre-K programs, and as a, a middle school teacher working with at-risk youth. Um, what we were proposing was a partnership with community services where we would basically hold slots in their program for kids who needed access to a program. Child Developmental Services, or Child Developmental Services, I always get the acronym mm -hmm. wrong. Okay. Um, CDS provide services to children with special needs. We don't pay extra for that. That's, there's no additional cost for that built into the budget. There wouldn't be additional cost for that built into the budget. We would try to provide those services with our staff locally, and CDS would pay for us to do that. We would try to provide those services to our kids locally with our staff to minimize the transitions for children and families as they move from a three and four year old program to, a, to the elementary school kindergarten and uh, grade school program. So you, you saw a proposal in your budget for roughly $50,000. That was our estimate of how many slots we were roughly going to need in working with community services to set aside those slots. Now, the great challenge for us has been, and the reason that you've had so little detail up front, is because we've been waiting on the state to provide its application for preschool program approval. Um, we met with preschool folks in the fall from the state to talk about preschool application and at the time they were very enthusiastic and the integrated program piece was something they were very excited about and preschool staff went, went to visit some, some model programs around and that program, the application was going to be online by the end of December. It is now mid-March, almost late March, and that application is still not online. So the challenge for us is families need to make commitments, and we can't guarantee them right now that we're going to have an approved program for their children to attend. Cape Care is already an approved early childhood program. That doesn't change, but in order for it to be an approved DOE program, Department of Education, not just DHHS program, we have to go through that program approval process. So we are now pushing back that timeline because we can't control what happens at the state level to next year. But you're going to hear my soapbox speech again next year about why we need preschool in Cape Elizabeth because I, I do believe it will make a difference for those kids. You heard about the results of our summer program and the gains that those children made in just a short period of time, I would expect that you would see similar gains for those preschool children. And, and those are some pre-academic gains, but I also think you do see the long-term social gains. Our, our kindergarten teachers, I'm sure, would be glad to tell you, as, as our first, grader, first grade teachers could tell you about children who hadn't had kindergarten not that long ago, um, they see a noticeable difference in those children's ability to socialize, to interact with their peers, to, to sit for a couple minutes at a time to understand instruction, to engage with materials and activities. It will be a good investment. I wish it were happening now because I think it will give those students an important jump start. I can't control where the state is, so we're pulling that proposal off the table, but we're going to be continuing to work closely with um, Cape Care towards the program approval process so that we can come back to you next year with a full plan to, to put money aside to invest in early childhood education for children who otherwise would not be gaining that access. And, and I, I think the, the important thing to emphasize is the difference between the target art audience that you're speaking of versus the audience that was represented in Mr. Gross's reports, two different, two different like cohorts basically. Right. Well, it's, it, well, no, not necessarily. No. I think the gains, the long-term gains for children in preschool, the children who gain the most are the children who, co who are most at risk. They are the children who have <coughs> had less exposure to vocabulary, who maybe have some developmental needs that, uh, that require some specialized instruction and access to opportunities that they might not otherwise receive. Mm -hmm. And we have those students in Cape Elizabeth as well. So just to clarify, you're, when you say you're, the proposal, you're pulling... We are pulling the money out of the budget because we 
can't guarantee the status of the state's approval process in time to really actively register students for this program for next year. Is that, I'm curious, we had about 50,000 proposed in the budget. Mm -hmm. And since the state isn't doing it, is it a matter of licensing or is it a matter of getting federal money? Both, <laughs> really. Um, it's a matter of licensing for us. The federal monies, but districts can be reimbursed for four-year-old programs, but it's a following year reimbursement. Um, that wouldn't happen right away. Um, and, and again, as you know, we receive... We don't receive the we, we don't receive the full amount of our cost of education. We receive a, a more limited amount. We're a we're a um, low receiving district, so the well subsidy would that. never offset the total cost. So it, 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 are you pulling it? Be, I, I'm trying. To, I guess I ask a different way. Are you pulling it because we won't have the necessary. We can't assure that we have nice necessary license, or we don't. That's yes, the main reason. That is the main reason. In that. Indirect, because I think it's a wonderful idea, personally, um, and I respectfully disagree with Bill because I think that part of our role and mission is not just providing uh, reading, writing, arithmetic. It's also the social and welfare development of every single child. That's how they become pr productive adults. It's silly to think we only teach people to read and do arithmetic. That is, our fiduciary duty is much broader than that, and I think that's part of it. So that's my soapbox. I I have one suggestion um, as you go forward with this that could be timely as a capture in order to uh, have a strong proposal for next year, and that goes to the uh, expansion to all-day K. One of the reasons Falmouth opted to go to all-day K is because there were a higher number of kids arriving in the school who hadn't had a quality preschool experience. And kindergarten teachers started to realize that at January benchmark time, there was really a, a lag for the kids who hadn't. So my suggestion is, since we're only now in the first full year, that perhaps longitudinally we could look back and see how you know what's the impact been of all day K in terms of of hitting benchmarks, and it doesn't deal with the social. Okay. Um, just, just so there's a, a, a stronger case, so that in addition, because that's the questions I've been hearing is in addition to all day K, why? Mm -hmm. And a big piece of it is um, access that children wouldn't ordinarily have. As someone said, we have excellent preschools here, but not everyone can afford them. That's right. So that would be just a suggestion. Yeah, and we certainly can provide that. Longitudinal data for full day K is something we can't exactly. provide yet. But, um, but it'll be a, but another year from now. Exactly. So you can look but at we that. We will have that data. Yeah, benchmarking. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the update. I'm sure we'll have lots of ideas as a board on how to flush out the pre-K opportunity. Um, one recommendation or a suggestion I have is maybe we go through the other staffing changes that we haven't touched on. Um, I think once we do that, when we review the salaries and benefits budget, we'll be able to put in context um, some of them. So I think we've covered all of them. Maybe if we want to hit, uh, well, we haven't covered all of them. Human, uh, human resource specialist shared with town. Um, do you want to start with that? Start with that, and then we'll, you know, that one. Then we'll do the uh, net cost incremental for the, you know, going from Ed Tech three. That's a voluntary service coordinator to the extended learning opportunity, and then the final one would be the admin support personnel health office. I'm going to let Mr. Wyman take it away. Good pass. Thank you. <coughs> so I'm passing to you a draft job description to give you sort of an idea of, of what that position would entail. Um, this first came up in a conversation this fall with the uh, town manager. Uh, there was a human resource, or human resource audit done specifically because um, the town departments are more decentralized. There's police, you, fire, Mr. public works, and they, the town employs themselves in the building. Ten, everybody tended to do something different. So they don't have a standardized application process, a screening process, a hiring process. Yet, as you know, the school department, we do the payroll for both the school and the town. We do the accounts payable. Um, we've actually now taken over and we're managing the family medical leave process. We investigate and we, we operate the uh, workers' compensation unemployment programs. 
And so one of the recommendations that the, that the study found was that we should really have a full-time human resource position um, for the town of Cape Elizabeth. And so this proposal provides a split position where we would fund half the position and the town would fund the other half of the position. When we really talked about what the needs were, we really decided we needed someone to actually do hands-on work and day-to-day -day work. Uh, we need to get our personnel files up to code. We need to make sure that we have someone who's coordinating training. We need to make sure that there's someone making sure we're doing all the compliance work that needs to be done for our employees. Um, and that is more so important for the town employees. The school employees are well trained and in compliance and many ways, but we still need to do more, um, for example, OSHA training for everybody. Uh, there's someone that needs to be dealing and, and focusing on the OSHA 300 logs and all the compliance that we have with OSHA um, and the, all the multiple levels of compliance agencies out there. Actually, we could just spend all day in compliance. Uh, there's so much to do. And we really need someone to do the hands-on day-to-day work. I, I, Meredith and I spoke. We talked to the town manager. The original proposal was for a director. We said we really need somebody that can do hands-on work and is there day-to-day -day and answering some of the basic questions for employees so they have a go-to. It would be operated from the business office at the school. Um, Arlene and I have talked. I will take on the heavy lifting on some of the major issues that develop. For example, I attend all hearings, I attend all mediations, um, I do that level of work. Um, we also need someone to do some backup learning on payroll, clients, personnel records. And so the recommendation we have now is in each budget $35,000, it would be about a $40,000, $43,000 position with benefits. It would be year round and they would service both the town and the school employees and provide some administrative support. Maybe Meredith can help with some. I know, uh, you know, there's a one-town model where, you know, I believe the school budget carries all the salary for, like, the director of facilities. Um, I'm, for, or what, what, I'm trying to understand, like, sometimes it's, you know... How, where's the line? You know, like the public works is all on their budget. The director of facility, I don't know, I right. believe the majority of it. it yeah, well, we, we share a lot of resources. We carry most of the technology staff salaries in our budget, but they carry half of a technician position in their budget. We carry our facility's budget, including half-time director salary or, and um, half-time director's assistant salary, right? Administrative right. assistant salary. They carry the other half of those positions. Um, Public Works takes care of all of our field maintenance. Right. They carry all of that in their budget. So it would be very hard <laughs> to sort of go through every piece um, of responsibilities that are shared across town and school. We carry the um, salaries for the business office staff. Those are 100% carried in our budget. So this position would be the first one that is the cost of which is shared, um, but they pick up the overhead for maintaining the town hall building. So, right. What about community service? How does this community service come in? They're a standalone budget. They're standalone. Stand They're yes. not. We're not but going through. Would the HR specialist work with community services staffing? Yes. Okay. That's, yes. Yeah. That's the. That was the real question. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So you want them to kick, when we consider their budget, we want them to pick up a tent? <laughs> yes, it's like the one that I'm on, but I don't want to get about the service. Mm -hmm. I just violated my duty as a, on the board of directors of that place. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. And, and what was, uh, so there was initially a recommendation that by some... The town had an audit, an HR audit done. Okay. By Daiquiri and Associates. Mm -hmm. Oh, next question. So there's a need, and in line with one town concept, why not divide it equally? Is that right? And does this also take in one of the, this is, this is the person who would take a one job of the IS director's proposed role of the com, um, not compliance? Affirmative, affirmative action. action. Affirmative action. This person will get the affirmative action for town and school. Service. I don't know about town. <laughs> and it de depends on. I might end up a town. 
you, so. you make it and make it down. Yeah. What is affirmative action? Does it mean harassment, a variety of things? It's Discrimination, not harassment. Okay. Hostile okay. workplace. Well, that's harassment. Sometimes. Well, that's how they define it. So. Barbara, did you have a question? I, I, I just, Scott, from your from mm -hmm. your time here and working with the town manager, yes. who was doing this before? Maybe not to the degree it should have been done, but who's been doing this? Many people. Every department has been doing their own, except for the school system, which is centralized in the business office. Okay. So everybody's been doing a little something, a little something different, mm -hmm. not necessarily all well. And we have personnel policies on the town side that are sit in multiple buildings that really should be in a central location. Mm -hmm. So this this would this would really be a major upgrade of of uh, coordination of efforts. Yes. And because it, it just it just made me wonder to go from that sort of spread out shared thing with that's maybe not perfect and a little messy to full time if there was any fit talk about sort of stepping up to it a little slower than all the way to full. Well, there is the, the consultant who was hired to do the study, and then the town has paid the consultant a, a, an honorarium so that um, the local uh, managers, so the police chief, fire chief, public works director, can call and seek advice. Mm -hmm. There is a, currently an intern from the Muskie Institute who is actually working on policy procedures onboarding staff. Mm -hmm. um, we have talked about potentially using our um, online application system so or something very similar so that it's a standardized basis mm -hmm. and that whole process would sort of be adopted from what we already do in the school department so it, from the town side it would be much more formalized and there is it is um it, it's not um get somebody on board and it's an easy fix yeah. there's a lot of work to do mm -hmm. and, and in your yeah. and in your view requires a full-time attention it does we really, and we, as we talked about, what we need is less is in the management staff, but more in the doing side, mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. we have a hands-on person doing a lot of the work and the lifting. And how many combined employees does the town and the school department have? Ooh, we have probably about 400 full time, I think, give or take. There's probably another hundred part time seasonal employees. Michael? Well, from whatever it's worth, every major law firm in Portland, a much smaller, smaller size than that, all of them have HR directors mm -hmm. and deputy HR directors. Mm -hmm. It is. Okay, did you it have is, a, It oh. is uh, just for the. It, they handle all kinds of things, not just, you know, uh, employment applications. Uh, or we don't have an. Well, I mean, the town has a risk. They have all kinds of issues they have to coordinate. Absolutely. All kinds of compliance. That's true. Scott, would um, you all set the Yeah. Um, what? Well, actually, I'll turn to Meredith, of course. Uh, okay. Meredith, does this take any work off our administrators? So, is there any? Would you talk about applications, hiring, the first process, any piece off of the hard work? No, I mean, administrators our work? application process is, is generally held. Andrea does all of the postings. Okay. For the district, she, we have an electronic system that we utilize to sort of collect applications. Administrators can all access that. Um, so, okay. so from that standpoint, I'm just thinking of any. Is there any benefit to? I know we're. I I believe we have to do this, but I just want to know while we have the administrators in the room, is there any um, anything taken off their plate that the HR person could do besides chasing down um, conflict? I would assume that there is some because I've been on a couple of hiring things which are coordinated by Jeff or by various other building administrations now can be coordinated by an HR person. There's some, it's not huge. Right, I wouldn't say it's huge because there's still a lot that the building administrator is still ultimately going to be the one who's sort of figuring out when the interviews take place and who's on the panel and... Uh, but collecting the applications, providing, you know... Well, we're doing that digitally right now, so... So I... So that particular piece, okay. I'm not I'm not saying there aren't other supports, but I, that particular one is probably not going to substantially change the work of our administrators. Um, it will support some of my office and operations uh, to a greater degree where we're actually being able to do more compliance from our level to make sure that our personnel files are in compliance. Um, 
from hiring to make sure the I-9 process is correct, to make sure the W-2s are in the right place, um, to maintain some databases for us and, and trying to make sure that we're more information friendly, um, producing that sort of thing. And I'm looking, f as we look to the future, I'm lo also looking for some um, someone who can learn the basics of payroll and coordinating payroll and time cards um, and doing some of that work because we need, we're going to need somebody in the next few years to grow into payroll. One, one thing, Kate, if I, yeah. one thing that occurs to me that probably is a benefit, um, sort of indirectly, in the sense that it takes a responsibility off that we probably theoretically are supposed to be doing now, as Scott mentioned, but we don't do very well <laughs> at all, and that is a bunch of the required annual trainings, um, yep. the various safety things <laughs> and that sort of stuff. And we fell and tried to coordinate some and did a good job for them. <laughs> as we were doing some trainings that some of us didn't even know we were okay. responsible for, it became clear that, that ultimately it was going to be, if it's not done, it's going to be, it's going to, when it it's falls another. apart, right. yeah. it's, it doesn't get done and something happens, God forbid, then people are going to be looking to the administrators. So in that sense, it does take, it doesn't really save time, but it does take a responsibility off that theoretically it does belong to us and make sure that some things are in place that we don't have to worry about. Okay. And then it would it also extend to booster clubs and um, uh, parent associations? No. Would they at all? No. No, because they're not part of our um, conversation. They're not payroll. They, they financially report to us, but I don't know. Yeah. Okay. That's correct. So if anyone has any further questions, uh, submit them. Uh, maybe we'll go through, Amir, if you could explain. Um, the Volunteer Extended Learning Opportunity Coordinator and how that relates to the reduction of EdTech 3, who's currently the District Volunteer Services Coordinator. So we have a, our longtime Volunteer Services Coordinator announced her retirement. Um, that position was a three-quarter time position. As you know, in our strategic plan, multiple pathways for students um, is, is a part of what we talk about, helping students access opportunities inside and outside of the classroom to grow and, and stretch. Um, we are doing some things now at the high school level, not as many as we might wish to, um, which is largely where students have the independence and skills to, to pursue many of those opportunities outside of the classroom, from internships to um, volunteer work in different opportunities to um, well, those are probably the ones that this position would most likely coordinate. Um, but, but we really don't have the capacity right now to do that fully. So this position would be able to not only keep maintaining the volunteer services that we provide, but would likely be physically located at the high school, and Jeff's confident that there's some space there um, where the person could be physically located so that they are available to make these connections, to set students up with internships, with part, to develop business partnerships, to make those connections, um, to provide students those multiple pathway opportunities that, that right now is sort of piecemeal and um, relies heavily on a, a, a very small group of individuals and luck in some cases. So I know that you know, you know whenever we call something district wide, there's a perception of its, you know, um, management and, you know, um, you know, not student facing, but this would be in a position in the high school that would meet with students, help, right. you and know. Part of that person's time would be spent meeting directly with students, meeting with staff, um, again, meeting with community members, businesses, intern coordinators, sort of make those connections to be able to set up those opportunities for students. <coughs> the volunteer coordinator aspect of the job, again, as we've had some conversation, I think, you know, uh, we do, um, a, uh, we process a tremendous amount of paperwork. Our volunteer coordinator spends a tremendous amount of time processing volunteer forms. Again, as we, uh, as a district, sort of look at you know, it is 2015, some of these things, and not to say that we're not doing our best to do that digitally, but, but there are some efficiencies, I think, that, that we can find moving forward that will streamline that process a little bit. For, for example, you know, 
we do a tremendous amount of in-person volunteer trainings, and I think there's still a place for that. But there's also some place for a refresher training that could be posted online. And you can go in and take, you know, view the training video, fill out a little questionnaire at the end of that, sign off on your confidentiality forms, submit your paperwork, allow us to then digitally have the paperwork right there to do our criminal record check. Again, the human resources person could have that access to that database, go right in and look at that. And so, so I think we can capture some of the time that's currently spent doing a lot of um, clerical work and reinvest that in support for students. And one other one, um, you know, say at high schools or uh, someone in the high school wants to, you know, learn German and there may be online courses, um, you know, they may want to reach out, you know, teachers are, I know, being asked to support this and have supported it and we've asked, you know, there's goals for multiple pathways, but is this someone who could also support, you know, uh, teach, you know, a student may want something that's not readily available and you know that they could do a lot of the background research and help you know facilitate that opportunity and support teachers and helping extend learning opportunities for kids such as that absolutely and i think right now some of that work comes out of our guidance offices it comes from individual teachers it right. comes out of Ruth Ellen. um so there are and those i guarantee you that those people will still play a role because that's still important um, you know, when the students are doing an internship, if they want to turn that into credit, there has to be some coordination with the department that they're trying to earn credit with. It could be an elective, but maybe they're um, working in a science lab and are want to be able to attain a science credit for proficiency-based graduation out of that experience. And so there's going to be some opportunity to sort of analyze what this internship experience is going to provide and how would that align with what the requirements are for proficien the proficiency. Is the net cost of this, I think Michael alluded to it earlier, really, um, it says add a full-time position at 45, but we're eliminating an ed tech, which seemed to do, have some overlap. So it's really That's only correct. that cost, it's about 26. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. hmm. Barbara? Uh, to, that, to that point, Meredith, and without trying to stress you out before next Tuesday, if, if Gail's current job description could be expanded to include I, that? Do yeah, you I thought those? that... Yeah, I thought that job description was previously oh, provided is it in to here? the board. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it in this front section? It's redlined, and I can't remember under what tab. Okay, you know, now that you say that, I sort of remember that. Hand it out. Thank you. You've got your hands right on it, Michael. Uh, I'll double check. If, if, uh, if we don't have that one, Barbara, we'll get it to you. Um, yeah, I, thank you. And now that you say that, I'm kind of remembering it somewhere. I know so. the director of special education was handed out, and the... Yep. Um, they all came at the same time. Okay. Right. Okay. So we wouldn't be changing the job description. We did change. We, no. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. It, it was in the handouts from yeah, March we'll, 3rd. So if someone says you're act. Why are you eliminating the Ed Tech 3? You would say, well, it is. It's new from Ed Tech 3 to a new position as the. Volunteer Extend Learning Opportunity Coordinator. That's so, correct. So it's a net 0.25 increase in, in staffing. Okay. And it's not an ed tech tree anymore, so that's sort of one of those correct. Neverland, in those Neverland contractual areas. It, yeah, it would fall essentially under the. Yeah. It's not under one of the specific collective bargaining agreements because it's not necessarily a position right. that has to have teacher certification. Right. It's not providing direct instruction right. to students. Um, yeah. Uh, it has to have some flexibility because there may be some afternoon and evening obligations. No, I think that's fine. Yeah. So if anyone has any further questions, uh, you know where to send them. I guess the last one, and I apologize if I missed one, for staffing changes that we haven't discussed would be the uh, admin support personnel at the health office. There are actually a couple more. So I'm okay. going to give you one thing first. And, well, I'm actually going to give you, you're going to get five pages. <laughs> and then, there's, yeah, they're awesome. And when you get them, put the top one on the bottom and look at the second page. Thank you, Jane. Put the top one on the bottom and look at page two. I can follow. I thought I put it in here. 
Thank you. Got it. Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll have to. The yellow I think it should be contingency. Only with the red. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> oh. I'm used to sticking pages in a, a trial notebook, but I have three page number ones and a page two and a page three. Maybe in the lower left hand corner, you tell me which tab to stick each one of these in would be perfect. Okay. I, I like the different colors, which kind of new, new, but. So once you all have them, again, take that top page, which is the summary chart, and put that on the bottom for right now so that you can look at the list of staff changes. There a couple of changes based on. Again, those those conversations um, among us as an administrative team. I maybe just given uh, we're going to be done in ten minutes, so uh, <laughs> All right. maybe if you can just I, go through <clears throat> what's new, yes, and then we can the board can submit questions. That's fine. And I, uh, yeah, I will try to spend a couple minutes on the question that you asked about the health office assistant as well. Um, at Pond Cove, you see a 0.1 increase in health teacher and a 0.1 increase in world language teacher, and that one <coughs> stays if needed. The 0.1 increase in health will allow um, third, second, third, and fourth grade. Right now, it's third and fourth, and, and the health teacher has a little bit of additional time available, um, but it would allow that extra half day would allow um, three grade levels to get health on a consistent basis. The point one world language, there are, as you know, we're projecting for one less fifth grade class based on student enrollment than we currently have. Again, we're, we're going from 136 or seven students in fifth grade to 112 in our projection. Um, so one less teacher, one less section of students, therefore, one less section of students who are taking world language at the middle school. So the proposal um, would be that we reallocate that time to Pond Cove, and then because it's unclear exactly how schedules will align, that there's the additional um, point one available if, if needed. And that addition of $12,300 or thereabouts um, is offset by a reduction in supplies at Pond Cove, so we'll, we'll get to that later. No change at the middle school. The high school, no change. It, it, it's a change on the sheet, but it's not actually a budget, budgetary change. Um, last time it said drama, but it, again, clarifying that it was, that was to cover both drama and music. Um, we just broke out the cost. We just broke out the cost. Change. Yeah, thank you. Uh, instructional support, no change in, in the teacher and educational technician numbers. Um, no change in instruction or business office going down to district-wide. You, you see the admin support personnel in the health office. That's a reduction of a half-time position. Um, I met with the nurses. Met with the administrative team. The nurses had some concerns as an administrative team, um, and again, their conversations with with the nurses in their individual buildings as well. Um, it, it, the heaviest need is at the high school. Middle school needs are minimal, um, and Pond Cove's needs are sort of concentrated at a, at a couple of different times of the year: beginning of the school year when Screenings. you're entering all the new student information, mm -hmm. and during screening times. And so, as we sort of looked at that, it's, it's not a half-time need. And you've got to remember that efficiencies in nursing services, at least in terms of technology, have changed as well. We've gone from paper forms for every student athlete that, that parents filled out in triplicate multiple times a year to being able to have that available digitally. There are still some other efficiencies, we think, that need attention there. Um, but but the level of administrative support needed district-wide has diminished from what it was 
even a couple of years ago. Um, so again, we looked at what that need was. The sense is that it's a need of about a day a week. Um, the, the feeling was that we had the ability to cover that internally. Um, and internally, right now, we anticipate, looks like one of the assistants from the middle school, one of the three administrative assistants at the middle school, picking up some of that support. The high school has a couple of periods during the year when you know they have a person who's probably going to pick up the district immunization report that's due in December, for example. Um, you know, our, our administrative support in all schools can take over the ordering of supplies for our school nurse's office. That doesn't have to be handled by a health assistant. So, so again, without adding a lot of additional time to any one person, um, we feel confident that that can be absorbed in a, through allocation of personnel from the middle school administrative support team. So the one question I have about that is during those high impact periods, especially the beginning of the year or even over the summer when you're reviewing, I know the nurse spends an enormous amount of time looking at um, incoming freshman health forms, um, will there still be enough capacity during those impact times to process that paperwork quickly enough? Mm -hmm. The other piece that, that we talked about is providing sort of a bank of hours for some additional time as needed. So our administrative support staff come in a couple weeks before the start of school as it is. If we need, excuse me, if we need some additional support for a few days prior to that, particularly at the high school to deal with uh, health forms for athletics, we can bring someone in to do that. Okay, great. And we also have, a, you know, the opportunity always to bring in substitutes for our nurses so that, it, you know, for example, we can bring a substitute in to cover one health office so that the nurses can work together on a screening day. Or we can bring in a substitute so that our nurse is freed up to work on a screening day. Or if we notice that, boy, it's an unusual year and we're finding a backlog of impact documentation testing. and or impact testing and or any number of things, we can bring in some substitutes to cover that. Um, our general budget proposal proposed an increase in funding for substitutes. Again, that's not about bringing in more substitutes. That's about being able to pay substitutes more. That's a procedural piece that we'll be bringing to you sometime this spring. In general, our classroom substitutes are pretty comparable to their peers, but we're still struggling. So we're thinking we're going to bump up the base rate of pay for our substitutes overall. But as we look at our nurse comparables, our nurse substitutes are underpaid compared to their got peer got district. So we've got to yeah, up got that one considerably. Things. So. So that money's already in the budget in our substitute lines, and, and again, as a team, we feel comfortable that we can meet the needs this way, and, and it'll be a trial. Um, we're continuing constantly with Noel's help to have, we have a power school user group that's sort of really taking a look at, you know, how are these forms working, how, how's the workflow, what is the parent experience like, and what is the experience of, of the nursing staff as well. I promise that it would be done at 9.30. One quick follow-up. Uh, does this ref reflect the most recent health insurance? It does not at this time. So we learned today. So we'll get a, so one thing, we have this, so we should hold, this will be current for about a day. So at some point we'll get a revised one. <laughs> so this reflects the staffing changes that have been right. addressed. And you can expect on Tuesday that you will get a revised one with the most up-to-date health insurance numbers. Again, we projected an 8% health insurance increase. We learned today that the maximum increase will be 5%. Um, so we will adjust our health insurance numbers to that 5% number for next week. additional savings. I, I'm, I have a question. I don't understand the math on the district-wide, but please check it. Everything was the same except that uh, we're adding back, in, we're not having a saving of 36000 for a half-time director of instructional support. It, I think that 9000 is is a, a new add-in, So, but you end up with a net $13,000 increase with before we had a $31,000 decrease. I, I swear to God the math doesn't add up. But, yeah. so, so the retiring director is not collecting benefits? And we assume that a replacement person would collect benefits. And any time we have a retirement, we project for family benefits for the vacant position. So that is the difference that you're noting. The 9000 mm -hmm. Well, it, it, the math still doesn't quite add up. So I just... Okay. I, we have a net reduction of 31 
and you're adding back in. Uh, right, but. No, it's the difference between the existing budget. Yep. I, I understand that. I'll right? explain it to you later. All right. I, I look at the columns, and it's supposed to be a total over on the right. The total was negative 31. Now it's a plus 13. I don't know how you do that. I don't see the plus 13. Over on the right, where you're, you're, total. Ad, you're adding back. Uh, right. Yeah. I'll You'll double check. You're adding back 36. All right, 9.32, we are done. <laughs> okay.